Hello and welcome to the 2012 Ohio High School Mock Trial State Championship Round Competition. I'm Jenna Gantz. The Ohio Center for Law-Related Education holds the statewide competition every year, and it wraps up with this championship round that will begin in just a few moments. We're coming to you from the beautiful and historic Ohio State House on Capitol Square in downtown Columbus. The room that we're in right now is the Senate Finance Hearing Room, which is currently a hearing room for Ohio Senate committees, but it served as the temporary Senate chambers during the State House restoration in the 1990s. This room was restored during this time, and special care was taken to match paint colors and other details to their original state. When the building was originally constructed, however, this room was the law library for the Supreme Court of Ohio, which makes it an appropriate setting for the mock trial. In 1901, the Supreme Court of Ohio heard cases here in the Senate building, in the room directly above us. Today, the third branch of Ohio government has its own building, the Thomas J. Moyer Ohio Judicial Center, just a block away from here on Front Street. Today, two teams of students from two different Ohio schools will argue a case before a panel of judges. They've been preparing for this as a team since September, when the high school mock trial case was released at the OCLRE's annual Law and Citizenship Conference. Each year, a group of volunteer attorneys create an original case about a current constitutional issue that is interesting for high school students. After the case is released, the mock trial teams work with an attorney or judge to prepare their case. In fact, each team prepares for both the plaintiff and defense perspectives of the case, but will only argue one side today. The two teams have advanced through three different levels of competition to make it to the state championship. The winning team will advance to the national tur tournament, which will take place in Albuquerque, New Mexico, next month. The 2011-2012 case is titled State of Ohio versus Storm Jackson. The case is related to the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which protects individuals from unreasonable searches and seizures. In this case, Storm Jackson, a college student, is accused of stealing prescription drugs from two real estate open houses. Without a warrant, the police department obtained the student's cell phone GPS records and placed him at the scenes of the thefts. The defendant filed a motion to suppress, claiming that the cell phone evidence was gathered in violation of his Fourth Amendment rights against improper search and seizure. The state of Ohio is the prosecution in this lawsuit and argues that Storm Jackson's motion to suppress should be denied because no improper search took place. You can read the Fourth Amendment here on the screen. One question in the case today is whether collection of GPS data from Storm Jackson's cell phone falls under this amendment. Our two teams in this championship round today are Archbishop Hoban High School and Indian Hill High School, Archbishop Hoban High School, Thomas, Team Thomas from Akron, Ohio will be the defense arguing for Storm Jackson. Indian Hill High School, Team Red from Cincinnati, Ohio, will be the prosecution, arguing for the state of Ohio. And joining me now is Todd Birch with Ohio Center for Law-Related Education, and he is the coordinator for the Mock Trial Program. Todd, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Um, now tell us a little bit about the Mock Trial. How does this competition work? Sure. This competition is composed of teams of students who portray both attorneys and witnesses on both sides of an original case. Each year it's a constitutional issue written by a volunteer case committee. In order to get here today, teams had to advance through both the district, a regional, and a state competition. So each team that you're seeing today has gone 8-0 up to this point. And how are the judges selected? Why is there more than one judge? The judges for this final round are representatives of our sponsoring organizations, the Supreme Court of Ohio, the Ohio State Bar Association, the Ohio Attorney General's Office, and the ACLU of Ohio, as well as other elected officials such as Representative Lynn Slaby. Now in a traditional mock trial setting, there will be three ballots and you'll have to win two of those ballots. Here there will be five scoring judges. The winning team will have to win at least three of those judges' ballots to win the round. And what are the main goals of the mock trial program? Well, of course, our main goal, as with all of our programs at the Ohio Center for Law-Related ed Education, is the educational aspect of mock trial, to teach students about their rights, about the law, about the Constitution, about the legal system. Of course, there's a competitive aspect of the program as well. Students learn public speaking skills, team building skills, and critical thinking skills, as well as many other very important skills. And how many students and teams are participating this year? This season, we had 350 teams from 178 schools participate at our district competitions. 31 total teams competed at our state championship over the last two days, and here you're seeing the final two teams of those 350. And can you describe how a team prepares for the mock trial? 
Absolutely. There's obviously some variance between different coaches, uh, different advisors. Uh, teams will often portray these roles in practice. Uh, during my time as a coach at the University of Cincinnati, we focused on a lot of repetition, uh, doing our parts over and over, our speeches, our questions to make sure that we knew those, as well as some inter-team scrimmages to prepare ourselves for courtroom situations. And also teams will sometimes scrimmage other teams uh, before our competitions to help prepare themselves as well. Great. Thank you very much, Todd. I appreciate that. Thank you. Now let's learn a little bit more about this year's judges. This year's presiding judge is Ohio Supreme Court of Ohio, Ohio Supreme Court Justice Robert R. Cup. Prior to his election to the Supreme Court of Ohio in 2006, Justice Cup served as the Ohio Court of Appeals in Northwest and West Central Ohio. Before becoming a judge, Justice Cup served 16 years as a member of the Ohio Senate. Gary Daniels is originally from Youngstown, and he is the Associate Director of the ACLU of Ohio, where he has worked for over 10 years. Mr. Daniels currently serves on the boards of the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education and Community Sheriffs of Mid-Ohio, where he's also on that organization's governing committee. Judge Jerry McBride serves as a judge for the Claremont County Common Pleas Court. He has also previously served as judge for the Municipal Court and as County Commissioner for Claremont County. He is a member of the Ohio High School Mock Trial Competition Committee. Ohio State Bar Association President Carol Subert Marks is a sole practitioner in Lancaster, Ohio, where she has focused her practice in the areas of social security disability, workers' compensation, estate planning, and probate matters. And finally, State Representative Lynn Slaby is serving his first term in the Ohio House of Representatives, where he represents the 41st District, which includes parts of Summit County. He recently retired from the 9th District Court of Appeals, and he served 14 years as a Summit County uh, prosecuting attorney. Those are the five judges for the 2012 Mock Trial Championship. Now let's talk a little bit more about what we're going to be seeing today. To help us guide us through that, we're going to be talking with Lisa Eshelman, a co-chair of the 2012 Ohio High School Mock Trial Case Committee. Good Thanks morning. for joining us. Oh, absolutely. Now what's the process the committee uses to create the case? Um, the committee actually begins its work in June, and it's a committee made up of lawyers from across the state of Ohio, and we brainstorm. We sit around a conference room table, and we consider things of what are cutting-edge issues that are facing lawyers all across the state and the country, and what would be of interest to students. And this year, we thought it would be it's very important for students uh, around technology. So we focused on a technology-based issue in June. Then the process is that it's broken down and we, we create and draft um, the witness statements and the briefs from there. And how do you guys make sure it's fair on both sides for the defense and prosecuting sides? I like to say it's creative writing 101. Um, we spend a lot of time um, reviewing the drafts, um, adding, adding facts and taking out facts to make sure we do the best that we can um, for a balanced approach. And then from there it goes to a review committee and the competition committee. So the, the drafts that we create are reviewed by a lot of folks. Thanks. And we'll have you look a little bit more in the camera, but how did the um, GPS tracking case originate from? It originated because there are a several lower court cases that are in the district courts, the federal district courts, as well as a significant case that was about to be heard by the United States Supreme Court. And actually during the course of the competition this year, the Supreme Court did decide that case. So that was kind of the reason, the genesis for how we created using this particular problem and fact pattern. That's really neat. And now as students that work with their advisors and volunteer attorneys throughout the year, what types of questions do they work through for this case? Well, they have to begin with just a good understanding of the facts. You know, the, the factual background and the record is the core to any good mock trial, to any trial. And then they go through the legal issues that are implicated. In this case, of course, it's focusing on the Fourth Amendment and the proper limiteds and scopes of um, searches and seizures. And so the advisors will sit with the students and They'll talk about how do those facts fit in with the law and then from that how do I create questions um, to get to what that law is and why I believe my side of the case should win. So it seems like a lot of work then, correct? Oh, these students and advisors put in hundreds and hundreds of hours when they get the case in early September um, until the beginning of the competition in January. Um, they're dedicated and um, lots and lots of time from a large number of people go in in order for students just to be ready for the district competition, much less when they get to this level. 
And how are the students scored today? How does that work? Um, there is a score sheet, um, and the, the students are not judged on the merits of the case. This really is a competition for the students to show their expertise in oral advocacy, examination of witnesses, and making the proper objections and arguments to the court. And then what kinds of things should we be looking for that the kids can uh, demonstrate that they're doing a great job? I know you kind of touched on upon it just a little bit right there. Certainly. Um, what, um, one of the, the things the judges will be looking for is the student's ability to get witnesses and have witnesses talk about the facts of the case through direct examination and cross-examination cases that support their theory of the case and their position in the case. So facts are very important. Um, there are certain trial procedures that the students have learned about. Uh, for example, uh, direct examination, you only ask open-ended question, who, what, when, where, and why, whereas on cross-examination, you ask leading questions. And so the judges will look for that, and they'll also look for the students to make coherent arguments on objections to evidence and objections to the law. And what should the audience be looking for to make sure that the kids are doing the case exactly as they should be? Anything else we should be looking for? Um, I, you know, some of good trial lawyers is, is that balance between being competent and also having that little bit of drama um, that keeps the, the attention of the court and sends home the emotional message. So I think for those of us who are watching it, that's always very exciting when you see something come from paper um, in June to when it really comes to life here in, in March. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate that. Certainly. We're going to talk to Lisa again during the judge's deliberation to get her take on how the students performed. Next, we're going to hear from Jared Wright's director program of the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education. Thanks for being here, Jared. Thank you for having us. Now, can you tell us what um, you guys do and um, Ohio Center for Law-Related Education and what you guys do? Yes, uh, we're a not-for-profit. Uh, we are 29 years old. We sometimes think we're the best-kept secret in Ohio, but we provide law and citizenship programs for schools. We partner with teachers so they can bring citizenship to life. And the Ohio Mock Trial Program is our largest program, and by the way, the second largest mock trial program in the country. But we have seven, uh, seven other programs that deal with citizenship, public policy, uh, problems that students can solve. We have two teacher conferences, and we do a number of professional development Specifically with the mock trial, what type of goals do you guys have as a group for these students? Well, as Todd had, had mentioned, it's we're about the education. All of our programs are aligned to the academic content standards for uh, the social studies as well as English language arts. So we're about the students being able to take statements and glean the information they need uh, to work collaboratively yet think independently, uh, to solve problems, uh, to work together in a group. Uh, and to be able to come to conclusions that they've formulated and that's uh, basically what we do with all of our programs and we also believe this program like all of our others are authentic that means they're doing a mock trial before real judges and real attorneys and the other programs we bring in legislators and political science professors so we'd like to think by the time they're finished they are more proficient at being citizens than they were when they started now, are there a lot of uh, volunteers through the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education that helps with these students and other programs? Oh, absolutely. For all the programs, there is uh, teacher advisors, and uh, there were more than 1,000 legal professionals who have helped with mock trial this year. So uh, we reach into all the different areas from the legislature to attorneys to the universities uh, so students, like I said before, could have an authentic experience. And you guys put a lot of focus in having the kids interact with elected officials. Um, What's the value of having them meet with those public officials? Well, I think they have a better understanding of how our government works. Uh, I think uh, they see that it's attainable. Wouldn't we like all citizens to feel perhaps they could be more involved in their government? And they find these people uh, are people with whom they can, they can talk and they can share their ideas. And uh, I think they're more familiar with their representative democracy. And why is it so important to have um, a mock trial competition? Oh, well, obviously kids are competitive. Uh, a lot of teachers are competitive, just like coaches. These people find the academic arena an opportunity to be competitive. But I think it goes back again to they can showcase what they've learned academically. And this is a great showcase for that. Great. Thank you so much, Todd. Or, Jared, sorry. Appreciate that very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. You're watching the Ohio Channel as we broadcast live from the Ohio State House for the 2012 Ohio High School Mock Trial Championship Round. And it looks like the proceedings are about to get underway, so we'll go now to the main floor of the courtroom.
May be seated. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final round of the 2012 Ohio High School uh, mock trial um, competition. Uh, I'm Justice Robert Cup uh, with the Ohio with the Supreme Court of Ohio, and uh, we have a distinguished uh, panel of judges and um, attorneys uh, here to judge this morning and. I'll have them introduce themselves starting on my right. Good morning. I'm Lynn Slavey, state representative for the 41st House District. I was former prosecutor for 14 years, former judge on the Court of Appeals, now state representative, uh, and soon to be uh, PUCO commissioner. So that's my background. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carol Subert Marks, and I am president of the Ohio State Bar Association. Uh, in my spare time, I practice law in Lancaster, Ohio, Fairfield County, where I have a solo practice uh, in a variety of areas, and it, I'm very pleased to be here today. Gary Daniels, I'm Associate Director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Ohio. Uh, I spend most of my time uh, over in this building lobbying folks like Representative Slaby. <laughs> Jerry, Mc, uh, Jerry McBride, I'm a judge of the Claremont County Court of Common Pleas, and I'm a member of the Ohio Mock Trial Competition Committee. All right, I think we're ready to begin. Um, is uh, the prosecution ready? Yes, Your Honor. And defense? Yes, Your Honor. All right, um, you may begin. Before my time begins, I'd like to take the time to reintroduce my team and myself. My name is Gloria Park, and along with my co-counsel, Aaron Hall, we'll be representing the prosecution in this case, or the state of Ohio. Now, to do this, we'll be calling two witnesses to the stand, in this order. First will be Detective Peyton Thurber, played by John Mang. Good morning, Your Honors. And second will be Dr. Shannon Gannon, played by Julia Horst. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Former Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, William Rehnquist states in the case U.S. v. Knotts, we have never equated police efficiency with unconstitutionality, and we decline to do so now. Your Honor, the defense would have you believe that everything that's effective in the field of law enforcement is by definition unconstitutional. But just because something works doesn't automatically mean it's against the law. On the morning of Monday, June 27th, reports of a potential drug ring reached Detective Peyton Thurber via local real estate agent, Drew King. Two different families, the Evanses and the Crosses, both open house clients of King, had reported separately instances of missing prescription drugs in their households. Two more families, the Delanes and the Kites, reported the same things to Thurber. Upon hearing of this, Detective Thurber immediately requested copies of the sign-in sheets of both of the open houses. And he, and he compared those two lists to pull out any names who had attended both. Taking the time to personally interview each person involved, Detective Peyton Thurber narrowed down the suspect to Storm Jackson. Then, Shannon Gannon, Spries and Wireless employee, disclosed Storm Jackson's GPS information to law enforcement. After Shannon Gannon's disclosure, Storm Jackson was arrested. Storm Jackson has now filed a motion to suppress this GPS information disclosed by Spries and Wireless. Now, in order to determine whether a search has occurred, we must apply a two-pronged test promulgated by the U.S. Supreme Court in the case Katz v. U.S. And this is precisely the Katz test. The court has already ruled that the defense has the burden on both prongs, both of which must be met not with emotional pleas, but with facts. They must prove that the defendant was tracked within a private residence, not just within its vicinity. And you'll find at the end of this hearing, that they won't be able to do so. Now the first prong and first issue is whether or not Storm Jackson had an expectation of privacy in his GPS data that was violated by the government. And the second prong and second issue is whether or not that expectation of privacy was recognized as reasonable by society. Your Honor, the defendant will not be testifying on behalf of the defense today. Therefore, there will be no testimony as to what he felt in regard to any of the issues, especially with regard to any subjective expectation of privacy. Furthermore, for the prosecution, Peyton Thurber will testify that the defendant's name was signed on both of the open house signage sheets, thus showing that he did not have an expectation of privacy 
as he exposed his location to the public. Shannon Gannon, Spryce and Wireless employee, Storm's phone carrier, will testify that Spryce and Wireless has a copy of Storm Jackson's signed contract and consent form on file, explicitly stating that GPS data could be collected, used, shared to provide and improve Spryce and services, and that by law, legal processes, litigation, or governmental authority, Spryzen could disclose this data, and they did. To show, that, to show that Storm Jackson's expectation of privacy was not recognized as reasonable by society, Shannon Gannon will, will again testify that GPS cannot pinpoint a person's exact location. So for all the defense knows, the defendant could have been tracked on a public road. He was tracked in multiple locations, in the vicinity of four different households. And this evidence will show that Storm Jackson released his information to a third party. And in the cases USC Miller and Smithy, Maryland, it was held that if information is released to a third party, the person who authorizes the release assumes the risk of disclosure and no search has occurred. Therefore, we respectfully request that you rule in favor of the prosecution and deny this motion to suppress the evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Is counsel for the defense ready? Yes, Your Honor. Before my time begins as well, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce my team. My name is Connor Lynch, and together with my co-counsel, Katie Capers, we will be representing the defendant. Today we will call two witnesses. First will be Ms. Quinn Ruby, played by Kelly Toman. And second will be Ms. Jaden Fitzgerald, played by Katie Frigo. Your Honors, may it please the court. The Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution affords every citizen the right, and I quote, to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Today, we the defense will meet our burden of proof by demonstrating that the GPS phone detail records obtained by the Glen Police Department were unconstitutionally obtained when they were obtained without a warrant. Today, the evidence presented to the court will demonstrate that the facts of the case are as follows. On June 25th and June 26th, prescription drugs went missing from four residences in Glen, Ohio, two of which were open houses conducted by real estate agent Drew King. After these thefts were reported to the Glen Police Department, Detective Peyton Thurber went to Mr. King and obtained the sign-in sheets that were present at those open houses. Now, Your Honors, using the unconfirmed, circumstantial information contained in those sign-in sheets, Detective Thurber contacted Shannon Gannon at Spry's and Wireless and requested the phone detail records of Mr. Storm Jackson. Using these records, Detective Thurber obtained an arrest warrant for Mr. Jackson. Now, today, the defense will call two witnesses to testify. First, we'll call Quinn Ruby. Now, Ms. Ruby is a telecommunications engineer who designs the GPS technology that goes in consumer cell phones. Based on her expertise, Ms. Ruby will testify that GPS is very accurate and, as a result, allows a law enforcement official, such as Detective Thurber, an intimate, uninvited glimpse into the every whereabouts of a person's location. Next, we will call Ms. Jaden Fitzgerald. Ms. Fitzgerald has a degree in law, as well as a degree in, its, in law and its association with science and technology. She conducts extensive consumer research on cell phone users, and in that capacity with the Electronic Information Privacy Group, she has testified before United States Congress. Today, Ms. Fitzgerald will testify that most consumers have a reasonable expectation to privacy. Today, the defense will rely on two cases. First, under Katz versus the United States, tried in the US Supreme Court in 1967, a two-part test was established to determine the privacy of information. First, a user must have a reasonable expectation to privacy. Second, society must reflect this expectation of privacy. The testimony of Ms. Fitzgerald today will show that not only did Storm Jackson have this reasonable expectation of privacy, but that society reflects this expectation. Second, under United States versus Maynard, 
tried in the 11th Circuit Court in 2010, the fact that Detective Thurber sees the totality of 48 hours of uninterrupted time violates Mr. Jackson's rights because it included time when he would have had a reasonable expectation of privacy. Your Honors, Storm Jackson signed up for a cell phone for service. But what he got was surveillance. He was monitored every second of every day. Now today, the evidence will demonstrate that the GPS cell phone information obtained by the Glenn Police Department was obtained when Storm Jackson has a reasonable ex expectation of privacy. And therefore, it violated his constitutional rights. And we will request that you grant a motion to suppress this information. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Uh, the witnesses will be sworn in at this time. Will all witnesses and parties who are to give testimony in these proceedings please step to the front? Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that it will comply with the rules of the Ohio Mock Trial Competition? I do. You may be seated. Prosecution may call your first witness. At this time, the prosecution would like to call Detective Peyton Thurber to the stand. May I proceed? Please. Good morning. Good morning. Please state your name and occupation for the court. Hello, my name is Peyton Thurber and I'm a detective at the Glenn Police Department. And how long have you been part of the Glenn Police Department? I've been there since 1990, so around 22 years. Subsequently, in 2000, I became a detective. And what kind of training did you undergo to become part of the GPD? I spent six months at the training academy where I learned about firearms, the Ohio Revised Code, and criminal detection and apprehension. In addition, I spent three five-week sessions field training with a veteran police officer. And I essentially applied my academy training on the streets. Now, you stated earlier that you became a detective in 2000. Did you undergo any additional training to receive this position? Yes, I certainly did. I spent an additional three months in criminal detection. Are you specialized in any specific field of criminal detection? Yes. Additionally, I have specific training in electronic crimes for which I took a 40-hour course. And where did you take this course? I took this course at the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. And what did you learn about at this course? At this course, I learned about GPS and how to use it to help solve crimes. Your Honor, at this time, the prosecution would like the court to recognize Detective Peyton Thurber as an expert in the fields of electronic crimes and criminal detection and apprehension based on his, pursuant, or based on his requisite skill, experience, and training pursuant to Evidence Rule 702. The defense objects, Your Honor. Pursuant to Rule 702, a witness must testify as to specialized technical information. We do not believe that this witness has enough information as to specialized technical information based on a one-week course on criminal detection. Objection will be overruled. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Detective Thurber, what is GPS? Well, GPS is actually an acronym. It stands for Global Positioning System. It's a space-based global navigation satellite system that provides location and time information in all weather, almost anywhere on or near the Earth. Now, as a detective, is GPS helpful to law enforcement? Yes, it certainly is. And how is it helpful? Well, GPS systems assist law enforcement with the types, times, and associations within crimes. Now, you mentioned a Department of Justice course that you took. At this course, did you learn whether GPS is part of the private or public domain? Yes, I certainly learned that. And according to what you learned, is GPS part of the private or public domain? I learned that GPS systems are part of the public domain. They are maintained and managed by the United States government and are freely accessible by anyone with a GPS receiver. They are part of the public domain. Now, at this course, did you learn whether GPS is an invasion of privacy or not? Yes, I learned that as well. 
And according to what you learned, is GPS an invasion of privacy? I learned that GPS. Objection, Your Honor. Improper opinion. May I respond, Your Honor? Um, in what way is the? I believe this question calls for the witness to offer a legal opinion, whether or not GPS is an invasion of privacy, i.e. violating a person's constitutionally protected rights, would call for an improper opinion as this witness is not certified as a lawyer. Your Response? Your Honor, Detective Thurber is not making a legal opinion. He's simply reiterating what he's learned at this course so that the court may be aware of what his knowledge of GPS and its boundaries were when he started the investigation. The objection will be sustained as the question was phrased. Yes, Your Honor. Now, does the, Glen, does the GPD use GPS? Yes, the Glen Police Department certainly does use GPS. And how do they use GPS? Well, we use it to help us assist with crimes. Now, what is the Glen Police Department's protocol when it comes to GPS? We make sure to follow our protocol, which dictates that law enforcement does not require a search warrant to obtain and use GPS information. Now, let's talk a little about the missing prescription drugs. Detective Thurber, were you notified of the prescription drug thefts that occurred in June? Yes, I was. And how do you know about them? Actually, the local realtor, Mr. Drew King, notified me of the situation. And what do you know about them? Mr. King had two open houses. The resident of the first open house, Tim Evans, reported a missing bottle of Vicodin. The owner of the second open house, Justice Cross, reported nearly 24 missing pills of Ritalin. And what did you do after you found out about these instances? I was immediately concerned of a potential drug ring in the city of Glen, and therefore I obtained both sign-in sheets of the two open houses. Let the record reflect that I am now referring to what has been previously stipulated as Exhibits B and C, the open house sign-in sheets. Let the record further reflect that I am presenting an unmarked copy to opposing counsel. So noted for the record. May I approach? Yes. Thank you. Do you recognize these documents, Detective Thurber? Yes, I do. And what are they? These are the two sign-in sheets that I obtained from both open houses. And what did you discover from those two sign-in sheets? Well, after examining both sign-in sheets, I discovered that there were sets of names that appeared on both lists. And what were those names? These names included Tom Jackson, Mary Jackson, Storm Jackson, Corny Smith, Penny Lee, and Riley Hines. Now, you talked earlier about the Evanses and the Crosses. Were those the only prescription drug thefts that you've heard of? Unfortunately, no, that was not the case. Can you tell us a little about the other ones you know about them? Yes, two other residents of Glen reported missing drugs. Sammy Lane of 300 Pine Tree Grove reported nearly 30 missing pills of Oxycontin. Skylar Kite of 299 Palm Drive reported nearly 12 missing bottles of Vicodin. And what did you do about these crimes? Again, I was immediately concerned of a potential drug ring and I personally interviewed those involved. So how did you narrow down the suspect to Storm Jackson? I corroborated the evidence that I obtained from these two open house sheets and the personal interviews to narrow down the suspect to Storm Jackson. Was that the only evidence you used? No. In addition, Shannon Gannon provided me with Storm Jackson's GPS data. And how did you use this information obtained from Shannon Gannon? Well, I used what is known as the triangulation method and determined that Storm Jackson was in the vicinity of all four crime scenes at the time of the thefts. So where did the GPS track Storm? Storm was tracked in the two open houses, a two blocks away in Coach's Bar and Grill, and also in a two-mile radius of Skylar Kite's home. Thank you. No further questions. You may cross-examine the witness. Good morning, Detective Thurber. My name is Katie Capers, and I represent the defense. I'm just going to be asking you a few questions. Of course. Now, Detective, you work with the Glen Police Department? Yes, I do. And you're working in that capacity on Monday, June 26th, 2000, Monday, June 27th, 2011? Yes, that's true. And you received a report from a realtor on the morning of June 27th, 2011. Is that correct? Correct. Mr. Drew King. Mr. King had conducted the open houses in Glen on June 26th? 
Yes, that's correct. And had both owners complained to Mr. King on the day of their open houses, the 26th? Yes. But you did not receive a report until the next day, the 27th? Correct. Now, King's was your first report of a potential drug ring, is that right? Yes. Now, after you received that report, you received lists of potential buyers. Do you still see those in front of you? Yes, I still have them here. And you found that there were names which appeared on both sheets? That's correct. Now, I'm going to list names which appear on both of the sign-in sheets just one, one more time, but please correct me sure. if I'm wrong. Riley Hines, Courtney Smith, Tom Jackson, Mary Jackson, Penny Lee, and Storm Jackson. And Storm Jackson, yes. All six names appear on both? Yes. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to the tops of those sheets. Now, both have spaces for the signer's address, is that right? Yes, that's true. Is Mr. Jackson's address or the address of his parents present on either of those sheets? No, not his address, but his name. Now, is Mr. Jackson's telephone number on either of those sheets or the telephone number of his parents? No, but again, Storm Jackson does have his name there. Is his cell phone number on either of those sheets or the cell phone number of his parents? No, it simply states telephone number, and he didn't put it there. So it's safe to say that Mr. Jackson chose not to reveal that information? He certainly chose to reveal his location. I'm not sure you understand my question, Detective. It's safe to say that Mr. Jackson refrained from providing that information on the sheets, correct? Oh, correct. The information of address and telephone number, but I would not say his location. Now, you were not present at these open houses, correct? Correct. No, I was not. You didn't have officers monitoring either of the open houses? No, they were just open houses. There would be no need to place officers there. Thus, you did not personally witness Mr. Jackson signing his name to those sheets. Is that correct? No, I personally was not present at the open houses. And you cannot be absolutely certain that everyone on those sheets actually was there, correct? Well, it certainly says Storm Jackson. Would you agree that the open houses are not the only instances that are pertinent to this case? I would certainly agree. I testified that on direct. Sam Delane reported that on Sunday, June 26, drugs were missing from her home? Yes, that's correct. And Skyler Pipe. Excuse me, I'm sorry, did you get to finish your, your answer? No, I was just saying 30 pills of OxyContin were missing. Of course. Now, Skyler Kite reported that on the next day, that's Monday, June 27th, Vicodin was found missing from his bag. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. 12 bottles. Now, Ms. Delane lives at 300 Pine Tree Grove. Correct. Mr. Kite lives at 299 Palm Drive. Yes, that's true. Mr. Evans lives at 262 Elmwood Street. Yes. And the Cross family lives at 400 Sycamore. Yes, that's true. So it would be fair to say that the suspected drug thefts on June 26th and 27th occurred at four different residences? Well, it depends how you would say the residences. They appeared that the drug thefts were missing in those residences. However, again, the tracking of Storm Jackson was in the vicinity. I'm sorry, did the GPS, I'm not asking about the GPS right now, but the reports. The reports occurred on June 26th and 27th, correct? Yes, the reports occurred on those days. And yes. they were reported from residences living at four different, door, four different houses, is that correct? Yes, the reports were from those houses. And in fact, those were on four different streets, correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, Mr. Kite indicated that he'd had a party, right? Correct. It was a neighborhood party to which every neighbor was invited? Yeah, it was an outdoor party. And Storm Jackson was invited? Yes, Storm Jackson was invited. Now, nowhere in your statement did you indicate that you have any eyewitnesses who can actually place Mr. Jackson at that party. I believe I testified in my statement. Detective, I'm not sure you understand my question. Nowhere in your statement do you indicate that you have any eyewitnesses who can place Mr. Jackson at that party, yes or no? That's true. I simply stated that no one in the Kite family knew whether Storm Jackson attended or not. In fact, nowhere in your statement do you indicate that you have eyewitnesses who can place Mr. Jackson at any of the four locations where drugs were found missing. Again, Is that, that true, Detective? Objection, Your Honor, I do believe that my witness needs a chance to respond. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes, respond. I'm simply requesting, I'm simply asking a yes or no question. If Detective Thurber did include this in his statement, he may say yes. If he did not include it in his statement, he may say no. Um, you, the objection will be overruled. You may proceed, and the witness will answer the question asked. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Detective, you didn't indicate anywhere in your statement that you have eyewitnesses who can place Mr. Jackson at any of the four locations. Is that true? That's true. I did not include that in my statement. Now, I'd like to talk to you about the GPS information that you obtained. Of course. Now, after you narrowed in on Mr. Jackson as your main suspect, you requested his cell site and GPS information. Is that right? 
Correct, Shannon Gannon provided me those information. So you were provided with the documents which you requested? Yes, the GPS data and historical cell site information. Now to clarify, this was after the events had already occurred, is that right? That's correct. Now to be fair, GPS data, it's transmitted automatically even without Mr. Jackson doing anything, is that right? Correct, though it is important to remember that the phone must be making contact with the cell tower in order for the GPS data to be transmitted. So as long as Mr. Jackson has service, his cell phone is transmitting data? Well, from what I know, the GPS, or excuse me, the cell phone must be making contact with the cell tower. So that would include things such as telephone calls, text messages, emails, that sorts of things. But Detective Thurber, GPS is transmitted automatically even without Storm doing anything, yes or no? Yes, that's true. However, it has to make contact with the cell tower. Now, you, you do have a, an arrest warrant for Mr. Jackson, is that right? Yes, I did obtain an arrest warrant for Mr. Jackson. But you do not have a warrant for the GPS or cell site information, is that right? No, because the Glen Police Department's protocol does not require law enforcement to obtain a warrant. Now, Detective, GPS does not stop working because a person enters under the roof of a home, is that right? Well, that would depend. Detective, does GPS automatically stop working just because someone steps under the roof of, an, of, an, uh, of a house? Again, my answer is still the same. It depends. But to clarify, GPS does not automatically stop working just because I enter under the roof of this courthouse, correct? I believe that's the same question you asked me, and my answer is still the same. It depends. GPS would not automatically stop working just because Mr. Jackson passed through the threshold of his home? Again, my answer stays the same. It depends. Of course, Detective. Now, assuming that all of the factors were in play, GPS has a margin of error. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. It provides a vicinity of possible locations. It does not pinpoint an individual's location. But the margin of error is fairly small. Is that right? Well, from what I believe, it's a fairly decent amount. So are you saying that GPS is inaccurate? That's precisely what I'm saying. It gives a range of possible locations. It cannot precisely track an individual's location. But you did rely upon it for your investigation, but you're saying it's inaccurate? That's exactly true. I'm not saying that GPS is not useful. It certainly is, though it is an inaccurate piece of technology. It provides a range of possible locations and gives a vicinity. Now, Detective, let's move on. You indicated that the GPS showed Storm, quote, within a two-mile radius on June 25th, 2011, of 299 Palm Drive, is that right? Precisely, and again, this demonstrates that GPS is not very precise, a two-mile radius. I'd like to go back to something now. Was Mr. Jackson invited to the Kites neighborhood party? I believe he was. So it could be assumed that Mr. Jackson is a neighbor? Well, I personally don't know Mr. Jackson, but if you want me to assume that, Okay, let's assume that Mr. Jackson was a neighbor. Now, I'd like to address the absence of a warrant in this case. Now, neither you nor the Glenda Police Department has a warrant on file for the GPS or cell site records. Is that right? Again, I testified before that the Glen Police Department's protocol does not require law enforcement to obtain a search warrant to use GPS data. Now, you did request, however, that Spurize and Wireless hand the records to you, correct? Yes, Shannon Gannon provided me the information. And to clarify, as you've said, the Glen Police Department's protocol is to obtain and use this GPS information even if you do not have a warrant? That's correct. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Do you have any recross? Redirect, yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Now, Ms. Capers talked a lot about the open houses and the sign-in sheets on your cross-examination. Could you have gone to one of these open houses? Absolutely. These open houses are open to the public. Though I wasn't there at the time, I could certainly have walked into those open houses. Objection by the scope of this witness's statement, extrapolation. Response? Your Honor, it's on redirect examination in response to Mrs. Capers' cross-examination. Furthermore, Nothing in the witness statement contradicts anything about going to the open houses, which is exactly what Detective Thurber said. Objections overruled. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Were you finished with your answer? Yes. I was just reiterating the fact that they are called open houses for a reason. I could have just walked in the open houses, but I was in the Glen Police Department at the time. And regarding those sign-in sheets, is Storm Jackson's name on them? Yes. Storm Jackson's name appears on both lists. Okay. Now, 
Justice Caper has also talked a lot about GPS on your cross-examination. Where exactly did the GPS track Storm Jackson? Storm Jackson was tracked in the vicinity of all four crime scenes. He was tracked in the two open houses and two blocks away from Sammy Delane's residences, residence, excuse me, which was probably Coach's Bar and Grill, and as Ms. Capers said, in a two mile radius of Skylar Kite's home. Now, how did you get this GPS data? Shannon Gannon of Surprise and Wireless provided me the GPS data and historical cell site information. So who gave you this GPS data? Shannon Gannon. And what is GPD's protocol in regards to this data? As I told Ms. Capers many times, the Glen Police Department's protocol does not require a law enforcement to obtain a search warrant to use GPS data. And is GPS the only evidence you used in this investigation? No, GPS was not the only evidence I used. I corroborated the evidence of the two signing sheets as well as the personal interviews and then confirming the information with the GPS, I narrowed down my suspect list to Storm Jackson and obtained an arrest warrant. Objection, Your Honor. I believe opposing counsel is merely recount, recanting her um, direct examination. Almost all of these questions are verbatim, the questions that were asked on direct examination. Asked and answered, Your Honor. Response? Your Honor, we don't believe that all of these questions are on the direct examination. They're simply in response to Mrs. Capers' cross-examination, as she did ask multiple questions about GPS and how he used it. So we're simply trying to inform the court of how he did use it and whether or not GPS was the sole piece of evidence that he relied upon. Objections overruled. You may proceed. Were you finished with your answer? Yes, I was. No further questions, Your Honor. All right. Do you have some, any recross? Your Honor. You may proceed. Now, Detective, it is your testimony that you placed Mr. Jackson in the open houses. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. In the two open houses. And on my cross-examination, you also testified that GPS is inaccurate? That's true. So which is it, Detective? Did you place him in the open houses, or is the GPS too inaccurate to tell? Well, I don't believe those two are contradicting statements. The GPS certainly placed the Storm Jackson in the open houses, but again, GPS is an inaccurate piece of technology. It provides a range of locations. Detective, I'm not sure you understand my question. Is the GPS too inaccurate to place Mr. Jackson in a home? Well, again, it depends what home you're talking about. But it was accurate enough to place him within two houses, is that right? It was accurate enough to place Storm Jackson within the two open houses, but again, I see no contradiction in my statements. No further questions. The uh, witness may be excused. Thank you, Your Honor. Prosecution, you may call your second witness when you're ready. Yes, Your Honor. At this time, the prosecution calls Dr. Shannon Gannon to the stand. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good morning. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. My name is Dr. Shannon Gannon. What is your occupation, Dr. Gannon? Well, currently I work at Surprise and Wireless, which is a cell phone provider and mobile telecommunications network. What do you do at Surprise and Wireless? Well, I work in the GPS department, so I work with GPS. And did you work anywhere before coming to Surprise? Yes, before working at Surprise, I worked at a company called Navistar Navigation, and they specialized in commercial GPS. All right, so how did you come to work at Surprise then? Well, I worked at Navistar from 1980 to 1988, and Navistar was bought by Spryzen in 1988, and I was asked to continue working in the GPS department. What is your educational background? Well, I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Ohio State University. I have a master's degree from ma uh, in mathematics from Case Western Reserve University, and I also have a PhD also in mathematics from Ohio State University. You mentioned that you work with GPS. Is this a new technology? No, absolutely not. GPS is not a new technology. All right, and how does one gather GPS data? GPS is gathered using satellites. All right, how does this relationship between GPS and satellites function? Well, at any given time, there's a constellation of at least 24 satellites orbiting the Earth. These satellites contain a highly synchronized time clock. Now, these satellites send radio signals to any GPS-enabled device. This device uses a highly precise formula to determine the user's location. How does this relate to cell phones? Well, most cell phones are equipped with this GPS-enabled hardware. All right. 
Does Spryzen use GPS technology? Yes, absolutely. All right, does Spryzen track its customers using GPS? Yes, we do. All right, and what must happen in order for GPS to track someone? Well, the phone must be making contact with the cell tower, so it has to be active. All right, now in his opening statement, Mr. Lynch s stated that GPS tracks storm every second of every day. What would have to happen in order for GPS to do this? Well, in order for GPS to essentially be tracking Storm every second of every day, that means Storm would have to be texting someone every single second of the day, or you'd have to be on the phone with someone every single second of the day, or you'd have to be on the internet or emailing someone every single second of the day. So I suppose it's possible, but very improbable. Objection, Your Honor, outside of the scope of the witness's statement on direct examination in Ohio mock trial, the rules stipulate that she may not state anything outside of her witness statement and nowhere is it contained anywhere in the statement about the necessity for tracking and, and how often these inf this information is uploaded and collected to this point. Yeah, may, may I respond, Your Honor? As I pointed out in pretrial conference, in the errata it does state that in order for GPS data to, to be collected, the phone has to make contact with the cell tower. The errata points out clarifications and changes to the case and therefore, it applies to Ms. Gannon's witness statement, and she may testify to this. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, and if that is the case, I would ask the opposing counsel to cite the uh, page of the errata sheet and read it for the court, just to clarify that this is in her testimony. Your Honor, would, I, would you prefer that I do that? Well, can you direct us uh, to the um, spot? Post? Yes, Your Honor, on the first page, it, I believe it's the third post down. Oh, second post down, excuse me. And it says, the GPS data is transmitted whenever the user's phone makes contact with the cell tower. For example, when texting, making or receiving a call, use, or using an app that requires internet access. Therefore, it is contained within the errata. This is an invention of fact. It's not an invention of fact. Um, I believe that's correct, so I'll overrule the objection. And you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Dr. Gannon, in order for GPS to track someone every second of every day, what would have to happen? Well, like I just said, the user would have to literally be using their phone every second of every day. And that's possible, but very, very, very improbable. Okay. Now, does Spryzen collect the GPS data? Yes, we do. Does Spryzen store that data? Yes, we store all the data. And how does Spryzen use that data? Well, we use it for business, marketing, and technical purposes. All right. Do you inform the customers of this data use? Yes, absolutely. And how do you do that? Well, it's stated in our contract that we may collect, share, and use location data. Okay. Hearsay. Uh, under mock trial rule 802, a witness may not testify to something that is not present in court. As the physical contract would be the best evidence in this case, opposing counsel has laid no foundation nor uh, introduced the actual contract to the court, and therefore it is hearsay under mock trial rule 802. May I respond, Your Response. Hearsay is limited to statements used to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Thus, a description of an event by a declarant not in the witness stand would be objectionable. However, words constituting conduct such as libel, slander, and contracts are not hearsay. Dr. Gannon is testifying as to the existence of a contract and that these terms in the contract exist, not that they are truthful. Thus, this is not hearsay. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, there is no mock trial rule, evidence rule, that ex exempts contracts from the rules of hearsay. The objection will be sustained. Thank you. Oh, also, Your Honor, move to strike the witness's statement. Um, motion granted. The witness's um, statement regarding that issue was stricken from the record. So, Dr. Gannon, do all surprising customers have to sign a contract? Yes, it's mandatory to sign the contract. In order to have service with my company, you have to sign the contract. All right, and to your understanding, does this contract inform them of the data use? Yes, it does. Okay. Objection, Your Honor. I believe this is the same thing as before. It's hearsay. May I respond, Your Honor? Respond, please. Dr. Gannon is not testifying to a specific statement within the contract. She's testifying as to what the contract includes in its entirety, not a specific written assertion. Objection overruled. You may proceed. Dr. Gannon, to your understanding, does the contract inform the users of this data use? Yes, absolutely. Do you have Storm, Con Storm Jackson's contract on file? Yes, we have both Storm Jackson's signed contract and consent form on file. 
Your Honor, she's testifying that they have it on file. There's no foundation that needs to be laid. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. Um, no foundation has been laid to show that uh, Dr. Gannon is the custodian of records at Spry's and there would have access to these contracts. Therefore, this fact would, is not uh, available to her personal knowledge if she would not, if she has not been laid this foundation before testifying. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. Dr. Gannon has testified that she is a Spry's and wireless employee and this contract governs her actions, and therefore she would have knowledge as to whether or not Spryze and Wireless has, their, has Storm Jackson's contract on file. I respond, Your Honor. Uh, the objection is going to be sustained. Yes, Your Honor. Dr. Gannon, do you work with GPF? Yes. Okay. And. How exactly, how exactly precise is GPS, would you say? Well, GPS, like any other technology, has a margin of error. It's about 10 meters, which is roughly 30 feet. All right, Your Honor, at this time, we've asked that the court recognize Dr. Gannon as an expert in the field of GPS technology, pursuant to evidence rule 702, excuse me, uh, because of her extensive experience with GPS and knowledge with GPS, excuse me. I have no objection. All right, Dr. Dr. Gann, let's talk about GPS technology. Let's say that someone named Caro is being tracked within his home by GPS technology, and a man named Knotts is being tracked about 30 feet away on a public road by GPS technology. Would GPS be able to tell the difference between their locations? No, absolutely not. The two people would appear to be in the same vicinity. The GPS wouldn't differentiate between their two specific locations. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross examination? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Good morning. Gannon. My name is Connor Lynch. I'm going to be asking you a few questions today. First, I'd like to ask you about your role at Spryzen. Now, you work at Spryzen Communications, am I correct? Yes, that's correct. And you work in the GPS department. Yes, I work with GPS. Which means that you don't work in the sales department. No, I don't work in the sales department, but doesn't mean I haven't gone to the sales department before. Nor do you work in the legal department. No, I don't work in the legal department. And you're not an expert on contractual law. No, I'm not. Now, I'd like to talk about Spryzen and consumer data. You collect information from every client. Yes, we collect information hourly and delete it monthly. And this includes the whereabouts of each cellular device. Yes, we use that for many, many reasons. Now, this is being collected 24 hours a day, am I correct? Yes. And the cell phone is collecting this data continually, am I right? Well, the cell phone has to be active and making contact with the cell tower. And wouldn't you agree with me that if a cell phone has service, it's making contact with the cell tower? Yes, it if it has service and it's being active. That's so, the key word, active. Dr. Gannon, you would be inclined as a Spryzen employee to boast about the service of Spryzen Wireless, wouldn't you? Well, that's actually... As to relevance, whether or not Dr. Gannon can boast about Spryzen services is irrelevant to the hearing at hand. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. This question simply is asserted to the establishment that the cell phone is transmitting data whenever it's making contact with the cell tower, which includes whenever it has service. Objection will be overruled. You may proceed. Now, uh, I'll ask you this very simply. This, if a cell phone has service, then it would be making some sort of contact with the cell phone tower. Wouldn't you agree with me? Yes, but it has to be active, so yes. So it would have to be turned on? Yes, turned on and being... Which means that it's collecting data whenever it's turned on. Dr. Gannon needs a chance to answer the question. She was cut off in the middle of a word. My apologies, Your Honor. I thought she had adequately answered the question. Uh, objection will be sustained. Now, Dr. Gannon, let's talk about phones in general. Phones are carried by individuals. Um, yes, but not all the time. So many people lose their phones these days. So a person can set their phone down. Oh, of course. That's they why could, they're so wonderful, because they're so portable. And they could lose their phone. Good. Yes, you could lose your phone. They're very easy to lose. But GPS in your cell phone tracks the cell phone only. Yes, it tracks the cell phone. And you've said that it's accurate. It's accurate. I wouldn't. Yes, it's accurate. Within 30 feet of accuracy? 32.8 feet of accuracy, actually. Now, 
Let's move on to Spryzen's agreement. Spryzen has a user agreement. Do you mean our contract? I mean a user agreement, yes. We have a contract, yes. And now let's talk about phone detail records. Phone detail records include the number making the call. Yes, they do. And they include the number receiving the call. Yes. How long the call started. Yes, they include duration and the outcome of the call, so whether it was missed, picked up, dropped, things like that. So that would mean how long the call lasted and the result of the call? Yes, I just said that. And this is all inside, and that phone detail records also include location data. Yes, they do. So phone detail records include more than just location data, you would say? Um, well, they don't include communication, if that's what you're implying. But they include location data in addition to all that information, the time it was sent, time received, result of the call, how long it lasted. Yes, numbers. Now, I'd like to talk to you about your interaction with Detective Thurber. The data that Detective Thurber requested was for a span of 48 hours. Yes, he did. And you gave him the data for that entire span of time. Yes, I gave him the data from June 25th to the 26th. Now, he didn't distinguish any other specific time frames besides the dates of June 25th and June 26th for that data. Yes, that's correct. And you gave him the phone detail records for that period. Yes, absolutely. I gave him the phone detail records. Which means that you included the time that the call was made, how long the call lasted, the result of the call, the number that it was from, and the number that it was sent to in those records that you gave to Detective Thurber. Well, yes, it's actually very difficult to separate the phone detail records from the location data. I could have done it, but it would have taken a lot more time, so I just gave him the whole thing. You gave him all, you gave it to all, all of it to him? Yes, I gave him everything. Now, Storm, or um, excuse me, now, Detective Thurber, that means what you gave to Detective Thurber was more than location data alone, correct? Essentially, yes. I now, didn't provide him any communications, though. That would have been highly unethical but it was still more than location data alone. It was just, yes. And Detective Thurber did not have a warrant for this information. No, and surprise and policy does not require a warrant to give out location data. Now, well, no further questions. Ms. Dr. Gannon, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, proceed. <laughs> Dr. Gannon, on cross-examination, you were asked about the precision of GPS. Can GPS give an exact location? No, GPS does not give an exact location. Rather, it provides a vicinity, which is not an exact location. Okay. And in order for someone to be tracked by GPS, what has to happen? Well, their phone has to be active. So this person has to be sending a text message or receiving one, making a call or receiving one, using an application that uses the Internet. So would the phone being turned on be sufficient to uh, meet this requirement of activity? Um, no, not unless right when the phone is turned on, a whole bunch of text messages stream in or a whole bunch of calls or an app just happens to start working. Okay. Statement. May I respond, Your Honor? Um, yes, please. This was addressed on direct examination that in the errata sheet, it does specify that in order for a GPS to track someone, the phone has to make contact with the cell tower, and the examples were making a call, a text message, accessing an application. That's exactly what Dr. Gannon just stated. Um, the objection will be overruled. This is a disputed point. We will proceed. So Dr. Gannon, were you finished with your answer? Yes, I was. Okay. Now let's talk about your disclosure of the data to Detective Thurber. Would you say you gave him more than he asked for? Well, I gave him essentially what I could give him. But would you say that's more than he asked for? Yeah, I guess, I suppose. All right. Let's clarify something. Are you a government official? No, absolutely not. And is Spryzen and Wireless a government agency? No, Spryzen and Wireless is a private entity. All right. So was it your action as a non-government official to give Detective Thurber this data? Yes, absolutely. Overruled. You may proceed. So, Dr. Gannon, was it your action acting as a, an employee of, of a private company to disclose this data to Detective Thurber? Yes, it was completely my own action. No further questions, Your Honor. Recross? Yes, Your Honor. Now, Dr. Gannon, is it your testimony today that a 
that Mr. Jackson would have to have been using his cell phone to transmit data? Well, it would have to be active. So maybe he's not directly using his cell phone, but it would have to be active. So maybe someone's calling him. That means he's not really using his cell phone, but it's, being, it's on and it's active. So I'm correct in saying that GPS data could be being collected and transmitted to Spryzen's database, even when Storm Jackson is not doing anything. Yes, technically, if his phone is just sitting on a table and someone calls him, then it would be transmitted and he's technically not doing anything. And I'm correct in saying that Spryzen's GPS data is uploaded to the server every 24 hours. Yes. Which means that there is some piece of data being uploaded every 24 hours, isn't that yes, correct? Yes, there's some piece of data. Now, you've said that GPS data is inaccurate, but we've established that it's within 10 meters of accuracy. 10 meters or 30 feet. And that, if you think that's accurate, it depends on your idea of accuracy. But within 30 feet, just for the court's reference. Yes, within 30 feet. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. The witness may be excused. This time for prosecution rests and moves exhibits B and C into evidence. Any objection to the evidence or the uh, exhibits? No, Your Honor. Right. The exhibits are so admitted. Defense, you may call your first witness when you're ready. Yes, Your Honor. The defense calls Queen Ruby to the stand. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good morning, Ms. Ruby. Uh, could you please state your name and occupation for the court? My name is Quinn Ruby. I'm a telecommunications engineer. Thank you, Ms. Ruby. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions about your experience with GPS. What does your position as a telecommunications engineer mean? Essentially, I specialize in newer communication technology. So what do you do as a telecommunications engineer? On a day-to-day -day basis in my everyday work, I designed the GPS-enabled hardware for consumer-grade electronics, such as cell phones. And what is GPS? GPS, which stands for Global Positioning System, is a satellite-based communication system that can triangulate the position of a receiver at virtually any point on the planet. And how do you use this technology? This technology has historically been used in applications for the military and law enforcement, but recently it's becoming more common in cell phones and vehicles and other consumer applications. And how does GPS work? Each GPS unit um, transmits signals to satellites that are approximately 12,000 miles above the Earth. How does this signal help you measure location? The satellite measures the distance that the signal travels, and using measurements from multiple satellites, it is able to form an equation to hone in on the precise location of the device. So then what do you have to do to design this, to design this technology? As a GPS designer, I work to engineer the technology to perform up to its limits and to be... Your Honor, as invention of fact, nowhere in Ms. Ruby's witness statement does she go on to explain what she has to do to design GPS. In fact, no further explanation is provided in, the, in her witness statement besides the first two sentences as what she does for her job and what she does in her job. May I respond, Your Honor? Uh, these are foundational questions uh, in an attempt to qualify Ms. Ruby as an expert, which she is in GPS technology. Um, if, if Your Honors want me to wait for this testimony until after she's qualified, I'd be happy to do so. All right, I'll sustain the objection this time, and uh, you may uh, re-inquire at the appropriate time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, what do you design it for? In my specific job, I design the GPS-enabled hardware for consumer products such as cell phones or vehicles. And how does a cell phone communicate with a satellite in space? Well, each cell phone that is enabled with the GPS hardware transmits signals to the satellite, which is, as I said, around 12,000 miles above the Earth. Your Honors, at this time, based on Ms. Ruby's extensive experience in her occupation as a telecommunications engineer, I would ask that she be qualified as an expert in GPS technology. Your Honor, the prosecution does have an objection to this qualification, as we do not believe enough foundation has been provided or laid for Ms. Ruby to be qualified as an expert in GPS technology. As the only information that the witness statement provides us for Ms. Ruby is that she works as a telecommunications engineer who designs GPS hardware, we do not believe that enough foundation has been laid. Simply because she talks about GPS does not mean she's qualified. 
Furthermore, for all we know, she could be working as a telecommunications engineer for one day. She could be designing the plastic covering of the GPS hardware. We don't believe that enough foundation has been laid, and we don't believe that enough information is provided. Mayor, response? I believe I've laid foundation that shows that Ms. Ruby does, in fact, work with the GPS technology. In addition, it is to your discretion as to how much foundation needs to be laid. Uh, education, training, experience, occupation, and knowledge are all one option that you can follow. Now, there's an or in the mock trial rules, and that means that it is at your discretion. I would also like to remind the court that opposing counsel has qualified their detective, who is primarily a detective as an expert in GPS technology, based on one week of, of informational sessions in GPS technology. And I believe that Ms. Ruby has much more experience, training, and I'm sure she has education uh, in addition to one week. On your honor. Yes. Um, first, to regard opposing counsel's statement, Detective Thurber was not qualified at any time in GPS technology, therefore he cannot compare his qualification to Ms. Ruby's. Furthermore, simply because he states that Ms. Ruby works with GPS on a daily basis does not mean that's in her witness statement, which is what she's bound to during direct examination. Furthermore, the OCLRE bolsters our objection as it states that Ms. Ruby has no educational or experience provided for her. I would object to that assumption. <laughs> All right, I think uh, we need to move on, and um, I will um, um, I'll let you ask the questions with, which are within the scope of her expertise. Thank you, Your Honor. That's your honor. Now, Ms. Ruby, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Based on your expertise, please answer each of these questions to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. If you're unable to do so, please be sure to let me know before you answer the question. Can you do that? Okay, yes. Um, now I'd like to ask you a little bit about the specifics of GPS technology. How accurate exactly is GPS technology? Well, GPS technology is highly accurate. There are some factors that can occasionally affect the accuracy, but the error tends to be minimal. And are you ever er able to eliminate error? Realistically, there never is error to eliminate. Given the high accuracy of the technology, we are usually able to have little to no error, and there's only rare instances where there is some error Objection, present. Your Honor, as convention of fact, Ms. Ruby has stated now twice or three times that GPS is highly accurate, and we ask, if you don't find that in the witness statement, she only states that it's fairly accurate, therefore, this is not admissible. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. She's testifying based on her expertise, which on direct examination, under Rule 703, I believe it is on expert testimony, she is allowed to testify based on her expertise regarding the accuracy and qualify her statement as necessary. May I respond, Your Honor? Even if she's testifying as her, as her expertise, she can't directly contradict what's in her witness statement. Yeah. She can't transcend the fact that she's said that GPS is fairly accurate more than once in her witness statement by now claiming in court that because she's an expert, it's highly accurate. I'm going to overrule the objection. Uh, one could conclude that the two terms might be synonymous. Yes, so Your Honor. You may proceed. Sorry, Ms. Ruby, did you have a chance to finish answering the question? Uh, yes, I did. All right, let's move on. Now, in your expert opinion, does this accuracy mean that a GPS location offers a user their precise location? The GPS data that is collected offers the user and an observer a precise location that can be used for things such as communication or other directional purposes. Thank you, Ms. Ruby. Now, I'd like to focus on how GPS technology is used in this case. Are you familiar with Storm Jackson's situation? I understand that Storm Jackson's cell phone records on June 25th and 26th are at issue today. And in your expert opinion, does location data such as Mr. Jackson's reveal anything? In my opinion, location data such as Mr. Jackson's would reveal the whereabouts of the phone for every minute that it was observed. Objection, Your Honor, as to lack of personal knowledge. Ms. Ruby has not seen Storm Jackson's GPS data, therefore she cannot testify as to her opinion on what it reveals. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. I was asking Ms. Ruby a hypothetical question under her qualification as an expert witness. I believe my wording was such as Mr. Jackson's, which would imply any cell phone user's data. She's simply testifying as to generalizations of the location in regards to GPS data. You may rephrase the question. Now, Ms. Rio, I'm going to ask you this again. In your expert opinion, does the location data of a cell phone user reveal anything? Well, in my past, in my past experiences, location data that is highly accurate 
would reveal both to the user and an observer the whereabouts of the phone for every minute that it was observed. It would give the precise movements of the phone. And how is this possible? Given the high accuracy of GPS technology, I'm able to confidently say that the data that we, that we are received from this data is highly accurate and it reveals the device's location, not simply a general area or proximity. So does GPS technology work within buildings? Of course, the GPS data transmits constantly, regardless of whether or not you're in a building. So if a person carrying their cell phone entered a building, would it continue to transmit GPS data? Yes, of course. It doesn't stop transmitting just because you enter into a building. And in your expert opinion, if GPS data was collected for 48 hours, how much of a glimpse into a user's location would that allow? Well, I would have to disagree with your use of the term glimpse. I think this data would reveal the total whereabouts of the phone. It would give the observer a complete and total look into the movements of this phone during the entire time that they requested the information. Dr. Schneider, this is an invention of fact. Regardless of whether she's making an expert opinion, there's nothing in her witness statement to support this claim. Sarah Fine, Your Honor. She's testifying based on her specialized knowledge, which is in her statement. I posed to Ms. Ruby a hypothetical question. The question read, if somebody, if somebody was tracked for 48 hours, how much of, her, how much of the location would that uh, reveal? And her testimony was that it would reveal all the location for that 48-hour period. May and I respond? well supported within her statement. May I respond, Your Honor? Please. Um, evidence Rule 702 testimony by experts states that this opinion testimony must be b based on reliable scientific, technical, or um, other specialized information, and we don't believe that foundation has been laid for Ms. Ruby to make this claim. Is there, um, can you point to anything in, in her testimony that um, would support um, the response you gave to the question? I can. If I may explain her answer a bit, uh, she is simply translating the fact that GPS offers the location to 48 hours. It's a simple deductive question. Um, now, under mock trial rule uh, 70, I believe it's 704, 705, I have given her uh, information, underlying facts or data. This fact or data included the 48 hour period that I was asking about. So in this question, the only expertise that I'm actually asking her about is the fact that GPS can track a location. Now I'm asking her that if it was tracked for 48 hours, would it be tracked for the whole 48 hours? It's just a simple translation of facts contained in her statement. Regardless, may I respond, Your Honor? Um, yes. Regardless, none of the claim, none of the information in her witness statement directly supports this claim that GPS can track somebody for 48 hours total, that it's not just the glimpse into their life, and we don't believe that this testimony is admissible because of that. I'm going to sustain the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. You may proceed. Now, I'll ask you this question. Does GPS, look, does GPS technology have a way to track, to tell who is carrying the phone? No, the GPS technology simply says where the device is. Thank you, Ms. Ruby. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination, Your Honor. You may proceed. Good morning, Ms. Ruby. Good morning. Now, let's talk about your perception of GPS usage. You think that GPS is getting to be increasingly common as a location tracking tool, right? Of course, it's common in almost every application you could think of. In fact, it's even used by military and law and, of course, by civil civilians. Isn't that true? Yes, this is true. And it's, it's utilized in things like cell phones, emergency equipment, vehicles, right? Yes, other consumer applications. So it's used in a lot of different types of technology then, right? Yes, it's used in virtually almost any application. Now, let's talk about your experience with GPS. GPS isn't a perfect technology, is it? GPS is not perfect, but it is highly accurate. In fact, because it's not perfect, it can be off by at least, by at most, 100 feet, right? In some instances, it could be, but that's the worst possible situation. But that's a yes to my question, right, Ms. Ruby? In some instances, yes. And GPS on its own can't conclusively say whether a person was inside or outside a house, right? 
The GPS data that we reveal is simply latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates. It cannot tell us if those coordinates are inside of a house or outside of a house. So that's a yes to my question, right, Ms. Ruby? Um, it just reveals the coordinates, yes. And in fact, you need other information to corroborate GPS, right? Of course, you would need something such as an eyewitness or fingerprints. And you can never really eliminate all of the possible um, contributors for ina inaccuracy, right? These factors are usually minimal, but when they do have an effect, it is hard to eliminate them. And you said on direct examination that you're really confident that GPS can reveal a device's location, not just the vicinity, right? It is highly accurate. Is that a yes to my question, Ms. Ruby? Uh, the location is highly accurate, yes. Did you say that in my direct exam? Did you say that in direct examination, though? That, excuse me, I don't understand the, the question. GPS can pinpoint a person's exact location? I did not say it could pinpoint the person's exact location. I said it reveals a highly accurate piece of data, but I did not say it could pinpoint the location. But not location, or not a vicinity, right? Not just a vicinity? No, it's a highly accurate piece of information, but it could not pinpoint it at all, no. And... And in its worst case, GPS can be off by 100 feet, right? Of course, this would be the worst possible situation. Thank you. No further questions. Redirect. Thank you. The witness is excused. You may call your second witness. The defense calls Ms. Jaden Fitzgerald to the stand, Your Honor. Good morning. Please state your name for the court. Good morning. My name is Jaden Fitzgerald. And what is your occupation? I am senior counsel for the Electronic Information Privacy Group, also known as EIPG. And what is your educational background? I received my bachelor's degree in computer technologies from Ohio Central University. I obtained a JD from the Evergreen University College of Law, and I also received an LLM in Law, Science, and Technologies from the Alexander University College of Law. And what is the purpose of your company? As a firm, EIPG focuses on a wide variety of issues, all related towards consumer privacy. Now, would you tell the court a little bit about your history with EIPG? Sure. I was a founding member of, of EIPG when the company formed in 1994, and today I serve as senior legal counsel. And today, what is your focus? Well, nowadays, my work focuses on digital security, government surveillance, and most importantly, consumer privacy. Now, we'll get back to that focus later, but could you tell us, day to day, what does that practically entail? Well. I maintain a database of reported instances in which law enforcement, public agencies, or private entities use GPS tracking to obtain information regarding the activities of private citizens or employees. EIPG also maintains a separate database monitoring state and federal legislation that often follows the growing concerns of consumer privacy. And what do you do with all of this data? Well, all of this data is scientifically analyzed. By analyzing this data, EIPG can identify and evaluate the growing number of trends of electronic privacy. How does EIPG relate to the greater professional community? Well, Ms. Capers, much of EIPG's research is used to support scholarly publications, law enforcement training programs, and judicial training programs as well. EIPG's research is also used by private companies to help establish internal policies and procedures. Beyond that, Congress has sought our guidance on matters related towards consumer privacy. What is your involvement in this work with Congress, if you have any? Yes, I recently testified before the Senate Commerce Committee hearing on consumer privacy and protection in the mobile marketplace. Now, Ms. Fitzgerald, I'd like to discuss the data and research that your company has compiled. Now, can we agree that your further testimony will reflect your scientific knowledge to a reasonable degree of technical certainty? Yes, we can. Now, what has the data that you've encountered shown about the sophistication of GPS devices? Well, GPS technology continues to grow ever more sophisticated. As demonstrated by EIPG's research, the ability of GPS to be able to track an individual's every movement 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 
raises substantial privacy issues for concerned consumers. As to hearsay, these, this research conducted by AIPG is an out-of-court statement used to prove the truth of the matter asserted. May I respond, Your Honor? Please. I believe this information is the pinnacle of, of hearsay exception 803 subsection 6, as it is a regularly recorded record of business activity. According to Rule 803 subsection 6, in order to testify as to this, the witness must have specialized technical knowledge and be relying upon the technical information. I've laid a sufficient foundation to show that Ms. Fitzgerald does interact with this data on a daily basis. She has regular interaction with it as demonstrated by her use of the database, her input to the Bay database and being called upon by Congress. And as, I, as 803 subsection 6 does specifically state that technical information can be discussed as not hearsay, I do believe that this further testimony falls under, under 803 subsection 6. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. In order to meet the hearsay requirement 8036, there are six requirements. It must be a memorandum report, record or data compilation of events or conditions made at or near the time by a person with knowledge if kept in the course of regularly conducted business activity and if it is the regular conduct of that business to conduct such a memorandum report, record or, or data compilation, Your Honor, you have not heard who conducts this research about the concerns of cell phone users. Ms. Fitzgerald only testified that she maintains a database of instances where law enforcement uses the, uh, GPS, not the privacy concerns related to it. And furthermore, we have no idea when this, was, when this uh, record was made, if it was made at or near the time. And furthermore, we don't know if it is, was kept regularly in the regular course of business conduct, as Ms. Fair, Ms. Gerald has not testified as to her personal knowledge of any conduct of EIPG besides the database that she herself maintains. And that database only involves the use of law enforcement in tracking. Your Honor, I would, object to, I would object to opposing counsel's assertion that all that is contained in the database is uh, information pertaining to law enforcement's use of information pertaining to privacy. I believe that Ms. Fitzgerald has already stated that they contain, that they use two databases, one which monitors state and federal legislation, which is ever, ever changing. She's also demonstrated that GPS grows ever more sophisticated. As to her being the custodian of record in this case, she has testified that she inputs this data on a regular basis. She has regular interaction with it as demonstrated by her being called upon by Congress to testify as to it. She has the sufficient education to understand the, this data and further I believe that all six, all six contentions raised by opposing counsel as to 803 subsection 6 have been answered although only one of them is required. Your Honor, I do believe that this is the epitome of what 803 subsection 6 was created for. Your Honor, may I be heard? Thank you, counsel. The objection will be overruled and you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. And Ms. Fitzgerald, what has the data that you've encountered at EIPG shown about the sophistication of GPS devices? Well, as I said, GPS technology continues to grow more sophisticated. As shown by EIPG's research, the ability of a GPS to be able to track an individual's every movement, including movements within their own homes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, raises substantial privacy issues for concerned consumers. All of these issues are addressed in extensive surveys EIPG has completed. Now, can GPS track people as they move? Yes, it can. Yes, you know, lack of personal knowledge. Ms. Fitzgerald has not testified that she works with the technology of GPS, so therefore she may not testify to this matter. Response? Your Honor, I believe adequate foundation has been demonstrated as to Ms. Fitzgerald's interaction with GPS. Further, if the court would like to direct its attention to line 476 to 478 of her statement, she specifically states that the movement that citizens are specifically concerned that GPS can track them as they move and that the movements are what is at hand that they're concerned about. I believe I've laid adequate foundation for this question. Objections overruled. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May I repeat my question? Yes, please, please do. Can GPS track people as they move? Yes, it can. Does that raise any specific privacy concerns? Absolutely. Now, could you tell me about how these surveys relate to that specific privacy concern? Well, the results of EIPG's surveys show that most users are completely unaware that their movements can be tracked using this GPS software in their cell phones. These users are very concerned that their private information can be obtained by other third parties and stored virtually indefinitely without anyone knowing it. So how much knowledge do these users have about being tracked according to your research? Well, Ms. Capers, the majority of those surveyed believe that 
All, all of their communications are highly personal and private. Any information that can be tracked and stored is also highly private and personal. Now, cell phone users in particular, what did EIPG find about the average cell phone user's privacy expectation? Well, cell phone users believe that the ability of a third party, such as law enforcement, to be able to track their the every... Your Honor, this is hearsay. Ms. Caper's question was, what does EIPG's research reveal about this? Nowhere in her witness statement does Ms. Fitzgerald indicate that she conducts this research. It's EIPG's research. The only research that Ms. Fitzgerald conducts is her database of reported instances in which law enforcement uses GPS. She does not conduct this, uh, in, this um, uh, research. And furthermore, Your Honor, 8036 is not applicable here because all six requirements of that rule must be met with testimony. Can and I furthermore, respond, Your Honor? Your Honor, just it because a witness finished. has education doesn't mean that she can testify about it. We have to know whether or not the person that conducted this research had knowledge. We don't know who that person is. We have to know when it was made, whether it was made at or near the time. We have not heard that foundation. And furthermore, we have to know that it was conducted regularly during the regular, regular course of business conduct. And there's been no testimony as to that. All we know is that EIPG conducts this research. If I may respond, Your Honor, as I've stated previously, Though we did not need to meet all six stipulations, we have met all six stipulations of 803 subsection 6. We have, de we have demonstrated, Your Honor, excuse me, let me find my page. And if Your Honors have a copy of the rules, this is on page 28. Rule 803 subsection 6, regular, records of regularly conducted activity. Now a memorandum, report, record, or data compilation in any form of acts, events, or conditions made at or near the time by or from information transmitted by a person with knowledge if kept in the course of a regularly conducted business activity and if it was the regular practice of that business activity to make the memorandum, report, record, or data compilation all as shown by testimony. Your Honor, again, I believe you've already ruled on this matter. As I've stated, I believe that this testimony does fall under 803 subsection 6. Uh, yes, we'll be consistent here and the objection will be overruled. May I re-ask my question, Your Honor? I forget what it was, so please do. Thank you. Ms. Fitzgerald, now cell phone users in particular, what did EIPG find about the average cell phone user's privacy expectation? Yes, it should be noted, it, our surveys found that cell phone users believe that the ability of a third party, such as law enforcement, to be able to track and store their everyday movements without the user's knowledge and consent is a complete invasion of privacy. Now you used the words knowledge and consent just now, but could you clarify? How does that relate to information sharing? What's the importance? Yes, well, those surveyed expect the service provider to consider their data and information highly confidential. They paid for the service and the phone, and therefore they do not expect the service provider to give out its client's information. If the provider wishes to give out its client's information, then those clients expect to be informed before that happens. Any additional observations based on EIPG research? Yes, Ms. Capers. It should be noted that cell phone users in particular require both knowledge and consent in order to feel comfortable with their data being given to others. Otherwise, in their eyes, a complete invasion of privacy has occurred. Thank you. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. All right. I cross-examine. Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? Please. Good morning, Ms. Fitzgerald. Good morning, Mr. Hall. Now, to clarify, you work for EIPG, right? Yes, I do. All right. So you don't work for a cell phone service provider, right? No. All right. And you work with how electronic tracking impacts individual privacy concerns, right? Yes, correct. All right. So you don't work in developing the specific technology of GPS, right? No, I do not. OK. Now let's talk a little bit about the research that EIPG conducts. According to your research on, cross -exam on direct examination, excuse me, you stated that consumers don't expect the service provider to give out their information. Did I read that correctly? Yes, I, I do believe that is what I said. All right, so let's say that a service provider, say, this is a hypothetical question. It can only be offered to a witness who has been certified as an expert. 
Your Honor has not ruled that this, in, that this witness is an expert, but if opposing counsel would like to do so, then he's welcome to. Well, I haven't heard the question yet, so I'll overrule the objection at this time. So, Ms. Fitzgerald, if a service provider such as Verizon Wireless mm -hmm. gives out a customer's information, then Verizon Wireless would have violated that customer's privacy, right? Your Honor, I'm asking her for her opinion, and she has given her opinion based on these surveys. I'm asking her to apply it to a situation. May I respond, Your Honor? The, uh, the witness can answer the question, so you may proceed. Could you please repeat the question? Yes. Thank if you. a cell phone service provider, such as, say, Verizon, yes. gives out one of their customers' information, well, then Verizon Wireless would have violated that customer's privacy, right? If Verizon Wireless did not contact the, cons the customer before they gave out the information, yes, that would be a violation. All right, so it's Verizon Wireless that would have violated their privacy, right? Verizon Wireless would have violated their privacy. Okay, and you'd agree with me that cell phone services like Verizon Wireless, they're private companies, right? Yes, they are. All right, and let's talk a little bit more about this research. According to your research, cell phone users believe that their data shouldn't be shared without their consent and knowledge, right? Correct. All right, so you say it's the sharing of this data that violates their privacy, right? They believe that their data should not be given out without the user's knowledge and consent. But to clarify, it's the sharing, right? Giving out, yes. All right. So whoever, in any case, gave out the information would violate the user's privacy, right? Yes, if they did not obtain the knowledge and consent from the user. No further questions, Your Honor. Um, redirect. All right. And I believe you may be excused. Thank you. Your Honor, we have no further witness, witnesses, and the defense rests pending the admission of the exhibit. Right. <clears throat> At this time, we would request the customary two minutes to compile uh, our arguments, if that's all right with Your Honor. All right. The, um, Exhibits will be admitted, and uh, you have two minutes to collect your thoughts here before we have closing arguments. Thank you. You're watching the 2012 Ohio High School Mock Trial Championship, coordinated by the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education. We're coming to you from the State House in downtown Columbus. Right now, the students have a couple of minutes to prepare their closing arguments in the case of Storm of Ohio, State of Ohio versus Storm Jackson. Archbishop Haven High School is arguing for the defense Storm Jackson. Their case is that using GPS data collected from a cell phone is in violation of a citizen's Fourth Amendment rights related to search and seizure. Indian Hill High School is arguing for the prosecution, the state of Ohio, that the collection of data does not violate Fourth Amendment rights. After the teams deliver their closing arguments, the judges will adjourn for a short while to deliberate, during which time I will have a chance to talk to some of the students participating today and get some of their perspectives. During that time, we will also have the opportunity to learn more about this historic building. When the judges are finished deliberating, they will come back to the room, give comments, and then announce the winning team. But first, we'll go back to the floor to hear the closing arguments. is back in session and we're ready for um, closing arguments and the um, prosecution may proceed if you're ready may it please the court we are here today because the defense filed a motion to suppress the evidence in the form of GPS 
the defense had the burden of proof. They had to prove that a search occurred. Your Honors, they had to meet this burden with facts, not assumptions. In order to prove that a search occurred, they first had to prove that government action violated a subjective expectation of privacy. In Katz v. U.S., a United States Supreme Court case, it was held that if someone seeks to preserve something as private, that person has an actual expectation of privacy. However, Your Honor, you have heard no testimony that Storm Jackson actively sought to preserve anything as private. In fact, you heard Detective Peyton Thurber testify that when Storm Jackson attended the two open houses, he signed his name on the two open house sign-in sheets, indicating that he revealed his location to the public. Your Honors, if he, didn't ex if he, if he expected privacy in his location at those open houses, he wouldn't have signed his name in the first place. Anyone could have walked in and seen his name on that list and known that he was at that open house. So therefore, he cannot expect privacy. Furthermore, the defendant did not testify here, so you've heard no information as to what he expected. And furthermore, no witness has testified as to what was going through Storm Jackson's mind or any act that he deliberately took to preserve his location as private. Furthermore, you heard Dr. Shannon Gannon testify today that Storm Jackson is a Sprys and Wireless customer, that he signed a contract. Now, Your Honor, Storm Jackson didn't have to be a Sprys and Wireless customer. In fact, when he became a customer at Sprys and Wireless, he bought a phone. But all the data that was collected by Sprys and Wireless was stored by Sprys and Wireless. That's not his personal data. And that's because he assumed the risk that it would be disclosed by releasing it to a third party. By purchasing that cell phone, he understood that Spryzen would use it to track him. As Dr. Shanigan testified, that the contract does inform users that they can be tracked and that, the, that their information can be disclosed. The second prong of the CAS test that had to be proven by the defense was that society recognizes this supposed expectation as being reasonable. In the case U.S. v. Forrest, it was held that electronic tracking is merely a proxy for visual surveillance. Furthermore, in the United States Supreme Court case, U.S. v. Knotts, it was held that if a person is tracked in places where his location can be visually observed by the public, that person does not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Therefore, Your Honors, in order to meet this prong of the CATS test, the defense had to prove that Storm Jackson was tracked inside of a private residence where his location could not be visually observed by the public. However, Your Honor, you have not heard any testimony that Storm Jackson was inside of a private residence where no one could have walked in and seen his location, and while he was in that private residence, that he accessed his cell phone. You heard Dr. Shannon Gannon testify that in order for GPS to track someone, their phone has to make contact with a cell tower. Now, in his opening statement, Mr. Lynch said that GPS tracks Storm Jackson every second of every day for all 48 hours. However, Your Honor, you have heard no testimony as to when Storm Jackson used his cell phone, let alone if his cell phone was on his person. In order for his cell phone to track Storm Jackson, he would have to have it in his pocket, in his hand, and he'd have to be using it, or someone would have to be calling him. Therefore, Your Honors, the only four instances of tracking that this court is aware of from the evidence are the four instances that Detective Thurber testified to. He testified that the GPS placed Storm Jackson in two open houses. He also testified that he could have gone in these open houses at any time and visually observed Storm Jackson's locations for himself. Therefore, in these private residences, Storm Jackson's location could have been observed by the public because anyone could have walked in and seen him there. Furthermore, you heard Detective Thurber testify that GPS tracked Storm Jackson two blocks away from 300 Pine Tree Grove. That's not within the private residence. That's three blocks away, so therefore, Your Honor, he was not tracked within that private residence. Furthermore, Detective Thurber testified that Storm Jackson was tracked within a two-mile radius of the other home. Your Honor, the defense has not met their burden by proving that Storm Jackson was tracked within any private residence where his location could not be visually observed. Your Honor, they like you to assume so. However, unless they can prove that Storm Jackson was inside of a private residence and that his phone made contact with the cell tower, they cannot meet their burden of proof. Therefore, we respectfully request 
that you rule in favor of the prosecution and deny this motion to suppress the evidence. Thank you. Counsel for the defendant, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honors, opposing counsel, may it please the court. The Fourth Amendment guarantees every American the right to be secure in his persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. However, the law cannot protect the privacy of citizens if law enforcement officers do not abide by the laws themselves. Today, the evidence has demonstrated that the Glen Police Department unlawfully violated Mr. Storm Jackson's right to privacy when they obtained his GPS information without a warrant and used it to observe the totality of his movements for 48 hours. The Detective Thurber's obtainment of the records was a search, as outlined by the Fourth Amendment. Yet, Detective Thurber has admitted that he did not obtain a warrant for the search. Now, Your Honors, the Supreme Court did establish a test in Katz in 1967. The U.S. Supreme Court determined that a search warrant is necessary if an individual has a subjective expectation of privacy and if society reflects this expectation. Now, contrary to what opposing counsel would lead you to believe, Storm Jackson and society as a whole do have a subjective expectation of privacy in their GPS information. In fact, the uncontroverted testimony of Ms. Jaden Fitzgerald reflects that society as a whole re requires both knowledge and consent before they feel comfortable with their information being disclosed to a third party. The testimony of Ms. Fitzgerald, who has testified before the U.S. Congress in matters of consumer privacy, reflects the fact that society as a whole does not deem it acceptable for their information to be subject to unwarranted search. Now, opposing counsel has attempted to introduce the idea of a contract in the courtroom today, a contract, Your Honors, which has not been laid before your discretion. They claim that if Mr. Jackson signed it, that he waived his Fourth Amendment rights. Now, the terms of this contract have not been discussed in court today, as they were deemed inadmissible. But even if the contract were present in its entirety today, it wouldn't matter. This is because the U.S. Supreme Court determined in 1967 that an individual must be able to rely upon the protection of the Fourth Amendment if he demonstrates a subjective expectation of privacy, which Mr. Jackson did in refraining pro from providing his telephone number, cell phone number, or home address on the open house signing sheets. Now, courts have also determined that individuals have a right to be secure in their GPS information. Just two years ago, the U.S. 11th Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in U.S. versus Maynard that GPS could not be used to track the totality of a citizen's movements over an extended period of time, as there is no expectation by any individual that his or her actions will be exposed to the public, nor monitored by law enforcement for 24 hours a day. Now, to clarify, the court determined that an individual does not abandon his privacy when he walks out his front door. The court determined that the Fourth Amendment secures for every individual, quote, a zone bounded by the individual's own reasonable expectations of privacy. Now, for most of the 48 hours reflected in Mr. Jackson's records, no, no, there was no suspicion of GPS, of, there was no suspicion of drugs being stolen. However, for most of the 48 hours reflected in the GPS records, Mr. Jackson was in this zone where he expected privacy. But most importantly, for some of this time, it can be assumed that Mr. Jackson was in his home, a place which has always been protected by the Fourth Amendment. Your Honors, in 1987, the U.S. Supreme Court determined in Carl versus the United States that an object could not be tracked via GPS if the object entered a private residence and revealed facts which could not have been visually observable by law enforcement from outside the home. It is important to note that Detective Thurber nor the Glenn Police Department performed any visual surveillance which could have substantiated the GPS records. It is also very important to note, Your Honors, that the evidence demonstrates that there are no eyewitnesses who can corroborate the GPS story. Your Honors, today we have met our burden of proof by demonstrating that one, Mr. Jackson had a subjective expectation of privacy and that society shares this expectation. Two, that in obtaining the entirety of Mr. Jackson's GPS records, Detective Thurber violated the standard established by Maynard. Third, that Detective Thurber went back in time in examining these records, making the state's use of force invalid. And fourth, that GPS is accurate enough, as demonstrated by the testimony of Ms. Quinn Ruby, to be an invasion of privacy 
as it could have been relying upon and was relying upon information which demonstrated that Mr. Jackson was in the zone where he expected privacy. For these reasons, Your Honors, we contend that this evidence is fruit of the poisonous tree, and we respectfully request that you grant our motion to suppress the GPS information of Mr. Storm Jackson. Thank you. Do you have a rebuttal argument? You may proceed. In her closing argument, Ms. Capers referenced the zone where Storm Jackson expected privacy. But, Your Honors, you have heard no testimony today to show where this zone was. Now, in her closing argument, Ms. Capers said that we could assume that Storm was tracked within his home. But, Your Honor, the law is not, ba is not based on assumptions. The defense has to meet their burden of proof with facts. And you have heard no such fact that Storm Jackson was ever tracked in a private residence where his location could not be observed by the public. Now, Ms. Capers cited the case U.S. v. Maynard, saying that it set a standard for prolonged surveillance. But, Your Honor, U.S. v. Maynard was not a Supreme Court case. The standard was set in U.S. v. Knotts when, it, when they ruled that if a person is tracked in a place where his location can be visually observed by the public, that person does not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Furthermore, in U.S. v. Maynard, Maynard was tracked for 28 days. And based on the sheer amount of data collected, the, co the court ruled in favor of Maynard. However, in today's case, Storm Jackson was not tracked continuously, as there has been no evidence to show that he was continuously sending text messages or continuously calling. And in fact, it was only a period of two days. Furthermore, Your Honor, the first prong of the Katz test states that government action must violate a subjective expectation of privacy. But the defense has made no reference whatsoever to government action. Your Honor, they can't make it past the first half of the first prong of the Katz test. Now, Ms. Fitzgerald stated today that whenever a, a service provider shares an individual's locations, well, that service provider violates the customer's privacy. But, Your Honor, Spry's and Wireless and all service providers are not government agencies. Detective Thurber was the only government agent involved. And you heard, Detective, you heard Shannon Gannon testify that it was actually Spry's and Wireless that did the tracking in the first place. It was Spry's and Wireless that disclosed the data. And therefore, no government action occurred. Therefore, we respectfully request that you rule in favor of the prosecution and deny this motion to suppress the evidence. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. That uh, concludes the presentation of the case uh, today. Um, the uh, scoring judges will be <clears throat> excused and uh, I'll remain for a while to discuss post-trial uh, matters. Once again, you're watching the Ohio Channel and the 2012 Ohio High School Mock Trial Championship. We're coming to you from Ohio State House in downtown Columbus. We just heard closing arguments for the mock trial case, State of Ohio versus Storm Jackson. Today, acting on behalf of the prosecution was Indian Hill High School, and the defense was Archbishop Hoban High School. Right now, the judges have retired to do their scoring, and while they're doing that, let's talk a little bit more about the case. This year's case involves the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. The question in this case, State of Ohio versus Storm Jackson, is whether using GPS data collected from a cell phone violates this amendment in regard to unreasonable searches and seizures. Once again, I have with me Lisa Eshelman with the case committee to help explain what we've been watching. Wow, this has been pretty amazing to watch this case right here. It is. Every single year when we come back, I'm always amazed at how these students have the mastery that we talked about earlier, not only of the facts and the law, but also of trial procedure. It's, it's just exciting and so much fun. 
Now, did um, what was your reaction to their performance today? Did they go? Did it go as expected? It, actually, it really did. I'm always surprised at um, they pick up on things. They they students find facts that are important. That when we're writing the problem, you know, six months ago, we're not quite certain how those facts will actually play into it. But today, it was just amazing to watch. And as you watched the case today, um, did the students make the arguments that you thought they were going to when you were putting this case together? Oh, I believe so. And that's also the, the fun of it, that you actually get to see that what we think is going to happen happens. And it also just demonstrates the mastery that these students have of the legal arguments that are applicable here. And it seems like the kids had to be quick on their feet. You know, coming up with um, objections and things like that, is that pretty typical or are you surprised by any of that? It is very typical, but it also demonstrates the mastery of oral advocacy. You know, what the judges are going to be looking at as part of the scoring is their ability to understand what the issue is, whether it's an evidentiary or other issue, and then being able to quickly think of how am I going to respond to this judge with that. And is that pretty normal? I know there. I noticed there were a lot of objections and going back to the rule of the mock trial. Is that typical for a mock trial case like this? I believe it is, especially at this stage of the competition where the students are demonstrating to the judge that they understand the rules and that they're able to apply those rules to a fact. So I think that this was pretty typical and a lot of times we see a lot of objections for things outside the scope of the mock trial program, or the, the problem itself, and sometimes when it relates to hearsay. And how did you think the um, witnesses did today? Aren't they wonderful? That, that's the opportunity where you can put that drama in that we talked about earlier because you see those, the students sitting on there and you kind of think, if I think that they're actually an employee of Sporizen or that they own the business themselves, and you know that the students have done a great job. And then did, was there anything that you were surprised at as this trial played out today? I'm always surprised at how well and these students are prepared and every year we see the amount of time that they've put into this really plays out um, at the end. And then is there anything else you'd like to say about the trial that you witnessed today? Um, I think I know who's going to win but we're going to leave that up to the judges. It did seem like they had some pretty strong contentions there out there. They do. I suspect that the scoring judges are back deliberating now, and it's going to be a very difficult call to make, and I, I anticipate that it's going to be um, just within a few points of each other because both of these teams certainly deserve to be here um, and certainly deserve to win. And how do you feel this trial um, went compared to past years? Uh, each year, I think as we um, the issues become more complex, the students are challenged in very different ways. And I believe that given the state of the law on technology and the Fourth Amendment, that this proved to be particularly challenging this year. So um, they're helping us make law. And then one last one that I had for you is, do each team, um, do they have like the same witnesses? They know who they're going to be talking to when they're up there on the stand? Um, the students have the opportunity to prepare their witnesses um, all during the course. And I think usually um, by the time they get to the competition, the team has decided um, which, which, which witnesses they're going to use um, to prove which points. And sometimes they may change that depending upon who they're coming up with on the, the opposite side. They may insert one witness and take somebody else out. Is there any challenge for them um, deciding between, you know, prosecution and defense? Because they don't really have a lot of time to prepare for that between yesterday and today. They, they do not. That's all part of the, the coin toss. So you have to think about that amount of time that they put in. They have to be ready to do either side, um, sort of at a drop of a hat's notice. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. All right. Now we're going to talk to some of the students that have been preparing today. Um, can you tell me your name, what team you're on, your school, and then um, also what you played for the trial? Um, my name is Katie Capers, and I am counsel for the defense for Archbishop Hoban, Team Thomas. Now, is there anything that happened during the mock trial that did or didn't go according to plan? Um, I would say it was a pretty standard trial. Um, we really respect the other team for their efforts, but I think we were well prepared for what happened today. and. Yeah, I think everything went basically according to plan. Is it challenging when they do objections? Does it ever make your mind go blank for a second or two? Um, mostly since we've done this so many times, uh, we know what objections are going to be raised. Actually, that's my favorite part of mock trial is doing the objections. But uh, today there were definitely a lot, and they were challenging, I would say. And then, um, what do you think that your team's main strengths were today? Um, I would say our witnesses did an amazing job as well as uh, it's always great to be set up by a great opening statement. My co-counsel Connor Lynch did a great job. So I think just our preparedness and our knowledge of the case really showed through. That was our strength. Well, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Alrighty, and I'm gonna have you just tell me your name, your school, and then what part of the trial you played on. Um, my name is Gloria Park. I go to Indian Hill High School, and I'm an attorney on the mock trial team. Okay, and what was the most fun, fun part of the mock trial for you? Oh, well, I mean, it was just a really good trial. It's not very, we got to play against a really good team, Archbishop Hoban, and the fact that we were in the finals in the first place was really exciting, and then, of course, just the whole trial in general, I thought was really fun. And then, um, is there an aspect of the mock trial that is more difficult for you? You know, one side that you have to work a little bit more at between the defense and the prosecution? Um, I think on the prosecution side, it's, well, for both sides in general, objections can be kind of difficult to manage. But I think both teams did a really good job with that today, so I guess not too much today. Well, thank you very much. You did a great job. Thank you. All righty. I'm going to have you just say your name, your school, and then what part of the trial you were. Absolutely. Um, my name is Connor Lynch. I go to Archbishop Hoban High School, and I'm a plaintiff, or I'm, a, excuse me, I'm an attorney for the defense on our team. I have to ask, do you have a photographic memory? Because you are spooning out those rules really well. I don't, you know, it's taken years of practice and uh, co counsels whipping me into shape to allow me to do that, and uh, I work hard for it. Now, how does it feel to have made it here, being in the State House, all the way to the championship round? It feels good. It's been a long time coming, and uh, I've worked hard to get here, but by the same token, I have to give all the credit to coaches and teammates and parents and advisors, basically. Uh, but it's really a great experience. Can you talk just real quick about the process of making it, you know, you guys get the scripts in September and working your way all the way up to now? Well, when we get the script, it's always really laid back. You start reading through it, thinking what's going to be important. And then once you start to refine and examine the case, you can start to pinpoint the points that you want to make throughout the, the, the course of the trials. And then basically at that point, you write, uh, you write your opens and your closes and your witness, your witness uh, examinations. And you just refine for the rest of the season. Well, you look good out there, so thank you very much. And Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. Go ahead and tell me your name, your school, and what part of the trial you played. All right. Um, I'm Aaron Hall. I go to Indian Hill High School, and I uh, do the closing argument on uh, the prosecution side and opening statement on the uh, defense side. Now, how has your team bonded over the whole process of the mock trial competition? I think that's probably one of the best parts about mock trial. I mean, we're like a family, basically. Like, that, the Indian Hill mock trial team, it's... It's really, it's it's like a it's like a big family. I, that's that's probably the most fun part, um, you know, competing together in all these different uh, trials and getting to know each other, and it's it's just a really fun process. I love it. And now that you've made it to you know the state championship round, is there any nerves that we're going through, or do you kind of you practice it so much you you're comfortable up there? I mean, we were all kind of nervous, but I mean, it's it was such a fun trial. I mean, Archbishop Hoban did an amazing job. It was just great competitors. It was. Just, I, I mean, I was a little nervous at first, but I mean, it's just it's just fun. But once once you get to this point, you know, there's nothing to lose. It's just go out there and have a good trial. So. It's and how fun is it saying objection when they're making their case? Really fun. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Are you feeling excited? Yes, I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm just going to have you go ahead and say your school, your name, and then what part of the trial that you played in. Okay. Um, my name is Kelly Toman. I go to Archbishop Hoban, and I was Quinn Ruby in the trial today. How hard is it to be a witness and not knowing exactly what the questions are when they come at you? It's always nerve-wracking for me to not know what's going to happen or what they're going to ask me, but I just try to think on my feet and answer the question as well as I can. Now, when the... Um, when they say objection, does it ever make you lose your train of thought or do you kind of have it practiced so much that you know what you're going to say? I have it practiced so much that I don't think it really throws me. It just makes my heart beat a little bit for my attorney, but other than that, it just I know what I'm going to say and what I have to say. So, And then so, now when you technically you practice for two sides, you know, both sides of the case, yeah. what side do you play on the other side? Oh, I'm not on the other side. We have enough people that we only have, we only have to play one role, so I'm just on one side. So you're a pro at it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Come on over. Hi. I'm going to have you just say your name, your, your team name, and then what school you go to. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Julia Horst. I'm part of Indian Hill Red, and I go to Indian Hill. And you are part of the witness, right? Yes. I play the role of Dr. Shannon Gannon. Now, um, can you just tell me... Um, 
you know, what are some of the unique ways that you guys practice um, throughout this competition to get to where you are today? Um, well, I couldn't really name any for sure. We just work really, really hard. Um, our legal advisor, or our coach, um, and our teacher advisor, Mr. Steve Rieger, he just has this incredible work ethic that he really instills in us. And that's, and, and just like working as a team, I think, we just try really hard and just spend so much time practicing. Now, is there a specific aspect of law that you've learned throughout this whole process? Um, just understanding law more. Um, and our legal advisors, you know, really are very knowledgeable of the law. And it's just understanding kind of what the amendments mean and just how to apply them into life. So I've just learned, I've learned so much. I couldn't name anything. All right. Thank you very much and good luck. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm just going to have you go ahead and say your name, your school name, and then what part of the trial you were a part of. Okay. Um, my name is Katie Frigo, and I go to Archbishop Hoven, and I'm a witness for the defense. Now, what made you want to participate in the mock, mock trial this year? Well, I mean, my brother did mock trial, and so I kind of just decided to do it last year, and I just decided I had a really fun time, so I wanted to come back. Were there any challenges that you had throughout this competition or specifically today? Um, well, the case this year is, it's, it's kind of confusing. I mean, it deals with GPS, cell phone records, so we had to really research and understand this case. So that was kind of confusing, but once we got it all down, then, you know, we were good. So. What would you tell other students that are considering participating in the mock trial maybe in future years? Um, I would tell them that it's a really fun program, and it's really good because it helps you um, with communicating to others, um, being in front of judges really helps with your verbal skills, your communication skills, so it benefits you in many ways. Great, thank you so much thank and good you. luck. Thanks. All right, we have one more. Go ahead and just say your um, name, your school, and what part of the trial you took. Uh, my name is John Mang, and I go to Indian Hill High School, and the favorite part of my trial is the part when I got to testify. <laughs> um, but actually, everyone did an amazing job. Archbishop Hoban was by far a very tough opponent, the hardest trial I have ever been in. So it was an amazing trial, fun trial at the same time, and it was just a great experience at it in general. Now, what made you want to be part of the witness? Is that something you got to choose to do? Well, yeah, actually, um, during we had tryouts in the beginning of the year, and I just felt that you know, as a witness, you had a lot of variety. Of course, the attorneys, they have a lot to do, but the witnesses, they get to be in character, and I enjoy uh, pretending I'm someone else. In this case, I'm a detective, so it was a lot of fun. Now, how much of this is memorizing and thinking, or how much is it like thinking off the, uh, your feet? I think there's a little mix of both. You know, on one hand, you do need to memorize your statement, memorize what your attorney is going to ask you, but at the same time on cross-examination, the other attorney is going to be asking you a lot of questions you've never heard before, so there's no way you can memorize just all the possibilities, so you would have to think off your feet. Now, do you ever slip something in to try to trip the other side? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, but I, I didn't do it this trial because there's no way I can get it in with amazing attorneys of Archbishop Hopin, but yes, for the most part, as witnesses, you try to slip some things in to help your side and, you know, hurt their side. And then regardless of, you know, what your team argued today, how do you personally feel about the issue of the case and using cell phone GPS? Well, personally, I feel like um, I, th I do think that Storm Jackson is guilty. And uh, if you look at it, he probably stole the drugs. But um, overall, yeah, I believe that the government, they, they can use this kind of technology, especially, you know, in our world when uh, technology is progressing and law enforcement has to catch up. So I do feel that... Um, I'm leaning more towards the prosecution side. Yeah, it, it's it's good for either side because you get the 30 feet feet and trying to determine, you know, if that's enough space to yeah. determine if that's, you know, he actually did steal those drugs. Right, absolutely. I mean, this trial is amazing and this case is amazing because it's very balanced. Uh, there's no one side that's has an upper edge over the other, and I think that the prosecution has their strong points and the defense has theirs, and I think they just cancel each other out, and it just depends how you argue it. And then where do you see yourself in the future? Is this something that you might want to take on past when you get to college and be a lawyer or anything like that? Well, I was actually thinking about it uh, when I was a little kid. I used to either want to be a lawyer or a doctor, but um, I think I'm leaning more towards business. But I think that Mock Trial is a great program, and no matter where you want to be in your future, it's gonna, the skills you learn from Mock Trial will help you no matter where you go. Thank you very much, and Thank good you. luck. Thank you. <laughs> As you know, the room we're in right now is the hearing room for the Ohio Senate. 
The Senate building is connected to the Ohio State House through the atrium, which was constructed in the 1990s, and these three buildings comprise Capitol Square. Since we're coming to you from such a historic location, let's get some more information about these buildings. The Ohio Channel's coverage of the 2012 Ohio High School Mock Trial Championship will resume in just a few minutes. The Ohio State House was completed in 1861 at the beginning of America's Civil War. The State House is considered to be one of the most significant architectural accomplishments in the early Republic. Its Greek Revival Doric architectural details and proportions give the impression of permanence, elegance, and grandeur deserved by the original state legislature who passed a law on January 26, 1838 to build the new State House. Restored to its 1861 appearance, the Ohio State House maintains its historic character as it continues to function as the center of state government in Ohio. The Ohio State House is situated on a 10-acre parcel of land that was donated in 1812 by four prominent Columbus landowners. The State House is upon foundations 18 feet deep, built in part by prisoners sentenced to labor. The State House features a central recessed porch with a colonnade of a forthright and primitive Greek Doric mode, built of Columbus limestone that was quarried on the west banks of the Scioto River. A broad and low central pediment supports the drum-shaped cupola, which contains a skylight that lights the interior rotunda. Unlike many U.S. state capitol buildings, the Ohio State House owes little to the architecture of the United States Capitol. It was designed and built before the U.S. Capitol was enlarged to its present form, with a large white dome that would become ubiquitous on government buildings in America. The Ohio State House has been termed a supreme example of Greek Revival style because the city-states of ancient Greece were the birthplace of democracy, this style had great meaning in the young American nation. Greek Revival is simple and straightforward and looks nothing at all like the Gothic Revival buildings popular in Europe at the same period. The broad horizontal mass of the building and the even and regular rows of columns resemble such buildings as the Parthenon in Athens. No ancient Greek building would have contained windows, but they were a major part of Greek revival for a more practical reason. Before the electric light bulb, sunlight was the major source of illumination. More than a century and a half old, the Ohio State House has been designated a National Historic Landmark by the Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior. This honor recognizes the long history of the building and the continued role it will have in the life and lawmaking of the state of Ohio. Surrounded by brilliantly white marble, you're standing in one of the most impressive spaces in the Capitol Square complex. It is enclosed by a ceiling of detailed murals, which surround a stained glass great seal of Ohio skylight. Before the massive renovations during the 1990s, it was not known that there was a skylight in this space because it had been covered from the inside and outside with pieces of plywood. Restorers speculate that the skylight had been covered because it was in such a state of disrepair that it leaked and might possibly fall out. It has since been repaired and secured. As you gaze upward, you'll notice the murals on the ceiling of the Grand Stair Hall. These four murals represent art, justice, manufacturing, and agriculture. Each painting shows a woman holding various related objects. Also used for decoration in the Senate building is gold and aluminum leafing. Although the gold leafing appears to be quite prevalent, there are only slightly more than three ounces of gold in the building. 
Today, the Senate building is home to 31 of Ohio's 33 senators. The Senate president and Senate minority leader both have offices in the State House. I hope you enjoyed that virtual tour. You can find many more State House tour videos at ohiochannel.org and on iTunes by searching for Capital Ohio. We have a few more students here to talk to us about their experience this morning. I'm going to have you just say your name, your school, and then what part of the um, team that participated that you were in. Sure. My name is Kristen Brennan, and I'm a senior at Archbishop Hoban High School. I was on the prosecution side of the case, so I did not actually participate today, but we had a few trials earlier this weekend. Now, how did you think you, your team did from kind of behind the scenes looking at them? Right. Um, it's always nerve-wracking to be behind the scenes and not actually participating, but I thought they did fantastic. It was by far their best performance, so I was very happy with how they did. And is it, um, sorry, yeah. is it um, hard, you know, not hard, but I guess going from behind the scenes, um, seeing how they did, were you, was the competition pretty hard for you to notice or anything like that? Um, well, yes, last year actually I participated in the competition, so it's a very big difference to go from participating and then watching. But um, I, there, the other side threw a couple of curveballs to our team, but I think they handled them well. So, yeah, there were a few difficulties, but I think we managed to handle them. And then how hard is it for your team to have that quick turnaround from, you know, knowing yesterday that you guys made it to the championship right. round and then making it to today? Um, it's definitely nerve-wracking. Last night was, you know, a lot of last-minute preparations, but um, we were excited. We knew we were well-prepared, so we just went out and did our best. And then how much time do you guys prepare last night to get ready for today? Um, last night we didn't want to overdo it, but we spent probably a couple of hours going over last-minute um, changes we wanted to make and we considered things that had come up in previous trials this weekend and so we tried to incorporate all of what we had faced in the past with um, what we could do today. And how did you think the witnesses did observing them? I thought the d witnesses did very well um, we, on both sides of the case. Uh, they were very knowledgeable about their facts and I thought they performed um, in their characters very well. And then just how would you compare the performance from last year when you guys did win to this year? Um, they were similar in that both teams were very respectful for respectful to each other, which is such a nice change from um, previous competitions or previous trials. Sometimes in the earlier trials of the competition, you've got a lot of argumentative lawyers, and it's a, it's a little more difficult to deal with. And I thought both sides were very respectful towards one another, and it made it very enjoyable. And did you think that overall the objections that they had were at the appropriate places or did, any, did it throw off any of your teammates? Um, I thought that the objections that were made we were well prepared for. Of course there's always one or two that um, we're not expecting but um, it was a relief that we could, we were prepared, we had faced some of the sim similar objections in the past so we were well prepared to face them today. All right, thank you very much. All right, we have another student. Go ahead and just tell me your name, your school, and what part of the trial that you participated in. Uh, my name is Ryan Kupchak. I'm a sophomore at Archbishop Hoban. I am a bailiff on the defense side and Shannon Gannon, a witness on the prosecution. So what do you do as a bailiff? What's, what, do you, what is that? I'm the uh, timekeeper. I hold up the time cards and make sure that everyone stays under time. Um, as of today, was everyone on time that you noticed? Um, for the most part. And at the close in the rebuttal, there was a a little bit over, a couple seconds. It wasn't a huge deal. Now how hard is it to prepare for one side compared to another since you don't know really until the night before? Um, it was a little nerve-wracking. Uh, I felt well prepared. Um, we didn't really have any changes to my witness testimony, but we had to obviously prepare everybody and then we got here today and they drew the other side. So it was a little uh, disappointing that we spent so much time on it, but it was, you know, it was worth it. What, what's it like making it to the championship round? It was really impressive. I mean, I was on the uh, freshman team last year, and I was we were knocked out in a district competition. So I was uh, really surprised to make it all or make it on this team this year and make it all the way to the final. It was it was a great experience. And what made you want to participate in the mock trial? Um, well, one of my friends actually was a uh, mock trial in grade school. He uh, did that competition, and they went pretty far in the states, I think. And he convinced me then to uh, take it up in high school and go on with the competition here and it's, it's great. Are you going to be participating in this in the next couple of years? Oh yes, definitely. And then what are your um, goals for after high school? Is this something you want to, do you want to be a lawyer when you're in college or you're still deciding? Um, I'm still deciding. I've considered it. It's uh, definitely an option. Always keep your options open, I guess. 
And just one last one for you. How do you think the, um, like going in front of five judges, is that pretty nerve wracking? Um, I feel like it would be. I didn't actually testify today, so I can't say for certain, but it would definitely be different because, you know, with three judges, you can focus on each one more, but I feel with five judges, you have to spread your attention, but I, I think it's the same concept. It's just a, a little more attention. You have to focus on each judge. Well, thank you very much, and good luck to your team. Thank you. The judges will be entering the room soon, so we'll, we'll, let's go back to that main floor.
Please be seated. Well, we're going to keep you sitting on pins and needles just a little bit here yet, but before the announcement of the uh, winners, um, uh, um, my colleagues uh, and I would like to offer a few comments, and so we're going to start uh, with um, Representative Slaby on my right. Thank you. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege for me to be here and uh, judge this competition. I've done it for a number of years, but the first thing I of course, I think every one of us will express our appreciation to the parents who have to put up with the gnashing of teeth and the crying and yelling and screaming uh, during this process. I want to thank the bailiffs for their work. But I want to tell you, the students, that uh, I would be very honored as when I was a Court of Appeals judge to have any one of you arguing this case in front of me in the Court of Appeals. You did an outstanding job, and I compliment you. And I would also like to echo, um, echo your comments in terms of the privilege it is to be here to see the hard work that has taken place by, by these uh, young students and the commitment of the parents and the advisors across the state of Ohio to get you here. I think you all demonstrated qualities that every trial lawyer must present to a court. I was very impressed with your abilities to think on your feet, to change uh, approaches. That, that type of flexibility uh, is very important to any, any lawyer, and, and that is something you really demonstrated well today. You obviously were all listening to yourselves, and that is another difficult trait to have. Sometimes you, you have a, a certain plan in mind, and uh, if you don't have the ability to listen to yourself and how, how those words are coming out, you don't, you, you don't have that ability to be flexible. So that was very important. You also exhibited a great ability to calm yourselves down. Uh, initially, uh, you, you know, it's, it's natural to be nervous. Every good trial lawyer is nervous uh, to begin with, but you have to have that ability to calm yourselves down, to be able to pace yourselves as time goes through so you don't expend all your energy uh, initially. So I again uh, commend all of you on your preparation and your success to, to get here today. Uh, I'll echo uh, the previous uh, comments. Uh, this is my fourth year in a row judging the, uh, the final round. I don't know if it's my memory that's faulty, but it just seems to be getting tougher and tougher each year. Uh, these comments apply to, uh, to both sides. Um, uh, the objections were good and substantive. I've watched past teams sort of make objections for the sake of making objections to show that they have a mastery of the rules. But uh, by and large, all of yours were very subst substantive. Uh, the uh, rebuttals to the objections were great. Um, uh, thinking uh, uh, and uh, adapting on your feet uh, to, what, uh, to what each other was saying was just, I think, maybe the best I've seen in a final round. Um, you really did listen to each other and, uh, and adapt accordingly your arguments. And uh, your command of the mock trial rules uh, was also uh, fantastic. So uh, 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 by and large, uh, uh, you, all of you did just a, a great job this year. I go last so I can say I echo everything that has been, <laughs> everything that has been said. Uh, one of the things I was impressed with, I, I agree, I, I judge this, uh, judge this a number of years and, and it seems like it gets better and better every year and one of the, I mean I talk, I don't see the teams usually that at, at any point that I end up judging in the championship round, which is good. but. Uh, I certainly hear about how teams have performed, and I, this is true, generally true every year, but it's certainly true this year. This is, I, you have performed at your top level in the championship round, which is really saying a lot. I know you have to be a little bit nervous, uh, and it didn't show if you were. I mean, it seemed like everybody was very composed both witnesses and attorneys, and the nuances that you found in this case. I did uh, judge a number of trials and, and saw a number of trials, and the, the nuances that you, there were nuances that you found that I had not heard in any other trial. So uh, in terms of strategies and finding those nuances and arguing those nuances, uh, 
both sides were really superb. Uh, witnesses, there were no weaknesses in any of the witnesses, uh, and the, tr true of the attorneys also, but the, the witnesses you stuck to your uh, statements, um, got in the information that was good for your team. There really were no gaffes that I saw from anyone, which is uh, amazing, again, given the pressure I know that you're under in, in terms of performing at this level. So great job. Parents, I'm sure, are very proud and have good reason to be proud. Teachers and legal advisors uh, are to be commended because I know how much time they put in working with all of you and uh, and it, it really has shown. So, congratulations. I'm pleased to uh, echo all of those comments. I thought the teams were um, fairly evenly balanced. Uh, you were all did a, a superb uh, uh, job. Um, and uh, I want to commend you on your civility. Uh, that is one of the hallmarks of the legal profession. And though you were vigorous in uh, presenting your case and making objections, you also did it uh, with a great deal of civility and professionalism, and I want to compliment you uh, on that. Um, I also want to recognize the, uh, the teachers, the legal uh, advisor volunteers. Um, it does take a lot of time, and uh, because uh, you have committed that time to these students, um, they have uh, received an extraordinary education uh, in our legal system, which will be uh, very important as citizens um, and as they either enter the legal profession or as they're uh, engaged uh, citizens uh, knowing about it and perhaps serving uh, on a jury or another career. And uh, finally, the students' um, uh, parents uh, and their families, uh, without your encouragement and support, um, they probably uh, wouldn't uh, feel quite as comfortable, might not even be involved. So that's extremely important. And I imagine you learned something from your students, too. Um, and I hope you are also able to present your case as well as they're presenting their case. Uh, and finally, I'd like to compliment the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education for their work in uh, conducting and sponsoring this mock trial uh, program. It is the second largest in the nation, which speaks very well, not only for the Ohio Center, but also for the ability to uh, recruit uh, volunteers uh, to participate. Um, over 3,500 students had an opportunity this year to participate in the mock trial program. Uh, there were more than 350 teams from 178 schools, and that is just uh, enormous, uh, and it's a really, really very uh, wonderful. And so um, with that, we will not delay any longer in um, our recognition. So Todd, I'll turn it over to you. I'm Mock Trial Program Coordinator with The Ohio Center for Law-Related Education. We're going to begin the presentation of awards here in a moment. Before I do so, I'd like to congratulate both teams on a great season. I know it took a lot of hard work to get here thus far. Thank you for your participation in the program and all the time that you put into it. I also want to thank all of the volunteers who made this possible, including our judicial panel here today, and all of our volunteer judges and legal advisors, our case committee, our competition committee, who put in a lot of hard work throughout the season. I would also like to thank the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education's sponsoring organizations, the Ohio Bar Association, the Ohio Attorney General's Office, the Supreme Court of Ohio, and the Ohio ACLU for helping to make this program possible. We're going to begin by introducing the, each member from each team's roster to receive an individual award of participation. To do that, I'd first like to invite Justice Cup to please come down and join me to help in presenting the awards. I'd also like to invite an advisor from, both, from each school to come up and introduce their team's students. We'll start with the prosecution. If I could have an advisor from Indian Hill High School, please join me. Thank you. Okay, well, let me go ahead and I don't think I really need this. Um, let me go ahead and introduce the, uh, the members of the team. And um, we'll start with those who competed. Um, Attorney Gloria Park, come on up. Attorney Aaron Hall. Thank you. 
are Peyton Thurber, John Mang, our Shannon Gannon, Julia Horst, our bailiff timekeeper, Catherine Fay. Attorney on the other side of the case, Lauren Schwab. <laughs> Witness on the other side of the case, Jordan Kahn. <laughs> Our legal advisors, one of whom is a former student of mine and actually appeared in the finals herself 10 years ago today, Sean Evans. And our other legal advisor, who was not a former student of mine, Dan Wenstrup. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you. Congratulations. And now I'd like to invite an advisor from Archbishop Hoban to come up and also introduce his participating students to all be recognized. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the uh, participants in today's trial, Ms. Uh, Catherine Capers. To Mr. Connor Lynch, uh, the other attorney today. <laughs> Ms. Kelly Toman, who played <laughs> Quinn Ruby today. <laughs> Katie Frigo, who played uh, Jaden Fitzgerald today. Ryan Kupchik, who is uh, our, our timekeeper, as well as our uh, witness, Shannon Gannon, on the other side. <laughs> Abby Dankoff, one of our attorneys on the other side. <laughs> Kristen Brennan, uh, the other attorney on the prosecution side. Anna Haradas, who was the, our Detective Thurber. And uh, we have a number of legal advisors. If I could have Mr. Mark Frazier, uh, Pete Cahoon, and Sam Prokop, and Mr. Kevin Hillary from Hoban High School, the team that represented it. And I want to just say there's a lot of other people that helped with all of this, and it's been great, and uh, well, all the help we've had from all the parents, and certain parents that helped a lot this year, and you know, with witnesses, we really appreciate all of that. Thank you very much. All right, it's now time to present our individual awards for this trial. First, I would like to introduce the recipient of the 2012 Ohio Mock Trial Final, final Round, excuse me, Outstanding Witness Award. And the winner of that award is Julia Horst from Indian Hill High School.
Congratulations, Julia. Next, I'd like to present the James Phillips Award for the 2012 Final Round Outstanding Attorney. Before I do, I'd like to say a few words about James Phillips. The Osterley Board of Trustees saw fit to name this award for him. Jim was the founder of Ohio High School Mock Trial. We would not be here today without his vision, without his dedication, so I'd like to have just a round of applause for James Phillips. And the recipient of the James Phillips Outstanding Attorney Award is Aaron Hall from Indian Hill High School. It's now time to introduce our state champion. Before I do so, I'd just like to say a few words about how that will proceed. What I'll do first is we will announce the state champion winner to come up and be recognized. Please, everyone, remain in the courtroom. After we do that, we will announce our state runner-up to also come and be recognized. Before I make these announcements, I would like to invite our entire judicial panel to please join myself and Justice Cup on the floor to congratulate our 2012 state champions. Okay, without further ado, your 2012 Ohio High School Mock Trial State Champion is Indian Hill High School. Finally, I'd like to introduce and have our state runner-up be recognized. Obviously, this was a great round. These two teams were the final two out of more than 350. It was very well executed. It's unfortunate that only one team could be our state champion here today. But I'd like to invite state runner-up Archbishop Hoban High School to please come up and be recognized. <laughs>
That concludes our presentation of the 2012 Ohio Mock Trial State Championship final round. I'd just like once to once again thank all of our volunteers, all of our participants. Let's have one final round of applause for all of our participants this year. watching the Ohio Channel's coverage of the Ohio High School Mock Trial Championship Competition. Congratulations to the runner-up, Archbishop Hoban High School, and to the winning team, Indi Indian Hill High School. They will head to the National Championships in Albuquerque, New Mexico. To purchase copies of this program or to view it for free online, visit us on the web at ohiochannel.org, where you can also view live and past video coverage of your Ohio government, including the Supreme Court of Ohio. For all of us here at Ohio Channel, I'm Jenna Gant. Thank you for watching and we will see you next year.